and rolling. Hi, and welcome to the introduction to FTC. Uh, we're coming to you live-ish from uh, MCC Penn Valley in Kansas City. I'm Glenn Crocker, and we'll have uh, several other people who will be presenting today as well. First, we're going to just talk through uh, the aspects of an FTC team. So you've got your competition season, and uh, Colin's going to talk a bunch about the game, and we've got team activities, and I'll be talking a bunch about those things. Remember that the most important thing in FTC is to have fun. So whether you're a coach or a participant, have a good time, or you're probably not doing it as well as you could. Uh, one of the most important things to remember with any FIRST program is gracious professionalism. There are a lot of different ways to interpret gracious professionalism, uh, and there are some facets of it that we call FIRST core values. Uh, those are discovery, innovation, impact, teamwork, inclusion, and fun. And the idea here is that if you're doing all of these things and doing them to the best of your ability, you're probably going to have a better experience for yourself than you would otherwise, and you'll probably make everybody else's experience better at the same time. So try to embody those and your life will be better. Phil was supposed to talk about this, but I'll keep going. Um, or actually, this is a Brad. Do we want to get Brad? Uh, I can go get Brad, yes. See if Brad's available. You should explain who Brad is. Brad is the volunteer coordinator this year, so uh, if you're interested in volunteering at an event, which you should be, Brad is probably the person you'll interact with about, with, about that. Um, if you're a coach, volunteering at an event is a great way to understand how everything behind the scenes works, and it'll help you uh, help your team better in the future. Um, if you're a parent, volunteering is great because it's like a one-day commitment, you get to see what's going on, you get to help the kids, you don't have to spend the whole day with your own kid, you can kind of be separate. Um, and if you're a kid and you're interested in volunteering, there are a lot of roles that you can do as well, um, queuing and things like that. So lots of opportunities for uh, different volunteers, and we'll talk about those more as we go through the different types of events that we've got going on. And uh, speaking of Brad, he's just entered the room. Brad, you want to say a word about volunteers and all that? <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Brad Kelly, volunteer coordinator this year, and I'm standing in front of the screen. So, over here? Our Stage left. Yeah, Stage bus. left. Fantastic. So, what to expect uh, at one of these events? So there's a couple of different types of events. There are meets, where there's no judging, and there are competitions, where there is judging. But in general, one week prior to either of these, you're going to want to make sure that your consent forms are all taken care of um, and this could be this could be a challenge because you have to work with parents to get them into the into the system to get approval so don't wait until the last minute uh, worst case you can fill out a paper form on site but you want to have it done digitally um, the Wednesday prior to a competition you're going to want to submit your engineering portfolio and I think there's some question as to whether this is actually going to be uh, available to do, but if it is, if we do go that route, you're going to, going to want to do that as soon as you can, <coughs> and that will give judges an early opportunity to look at your team's portfolio, which is, which is wonderful. That way they come in, they're familiar with your team, and there's less of a learning curve that morning. Day of, you're going to check in, you're going to hand in your team roster, this is a, a must have sort of thing. You can print that from the first website. You're also going to turn in your engineering portfolio that day uh, if it wasn't done before, and any award forms, control award and so forth, you're going to turn those in as well. Now this stuff here for the engineering portfolio and the awards form, I have a little light, uh, <laughs> will, not be ha will not be turned in if it's just a meet because there's no judging uh, and it's, it's not germane on those days. Um, if you want to get judge feedback at a competition, there's a form to fill out for there as well. And you're going to want to print that off from the first website. I want to bring that with you. We may have them on site. Um, something that's very important on the day of one of these events is your robot inspection. There's a sheet that you fill out. You can download it from the first website. You're going to want to do that uh, as a self-inspection before you ever show up at the inspection pit. And that's 
really a requirement. It's going to save a ton of time. It's good for you and your team. And uh, but you're going to want to pass robot inspection. There's usually a, usually a, a queuing time for that sort of thing on site. Okay. Um, the biggest takeaways here at these at these uh, these days is ask for help. Uh, that's one of the big purposes of these. Um, you need a part. Ask. Somebody's got one. Um, you're not sure what's going on? Ask. Somebody knows. Somebody can tell you. Even if it's even if it's not one of the if you can't uh, locate uh, you know a volunteer or administrator, other team members will know what's going on. Um, if you're going to be late, you're stuck in traffic. Whatever. Let us know. So uh, for any of the meets or the competitions, you'll have the phone number for the for the site coordinator. Reach out. Let them know you're going to be late. Um, if something has gone wrong with your robot or you can't get it to drive or whatever and you're thinking about not coming because you just don't want to put the kids through that come anyway because there are there are people on site who will help you get up and running and it is far better to come and work through something than to not come because of a problem like that believe me um, also the best way for a new team to have a great first competition is to ask too many questions. There's no such thing as too many questions of these things. This is all about learning. They're fantastic experiences, uh, and you you don't want to miss out. And I think that's that's this slide. Awesome. Thank you, Brad. Um, next, I'd like to have Phil come up and talk a little bit about the competition season. And there are several different types of events that Phil will walk you through, um, starting out with league meets. And Brad talked a little bit about that, but uh, we'll get into a little bit more detail about what meets are and their implications for your team. Am I good? Yeah. Excellent. So good morning, and I want to talk a little bit about the season this year. So when you signed up, we are taking all the teams in the Missouri, Kansas area, and then we were putting them together into geographic locations for leagues. And so you will be placed in a league that could have up to 36 teams in your area. And then the league will play a series of competitions called meets. Those meets are four hour events, no more than 12 teams. It's field competition only, and there's no judging. And you will play in at least two of those events. And you will play six matches in each of those events, so 12 opportunities to score. You will take your 10 best scores, and those will go with you to the league championship. So at the end of the season, we will play a league championship that will be for every team that's in the league, and they will come together, and that will be, for those that have been around, just like a qualifier. So what that means is you will not only have field competition, but you will also have judging, and you will be able to um, compete for awards as, as well. Go back to the last slide. There we go. So some dates to keep in mind. So we have uh, meets that have been set up on uh, November 20th is our first opportunity for meets, a morning and an afternoon. December 4th, December 11th, 18th, January 15th, and January 22nd. The question mark around December 11th is that is a meet at Knob Noster and it's up in the air as to whether Knob Noster will be in our league or not, but if they are, we have that opportunity. The league championship has been confirmed for January 29th and will be at Belton. Uh, lots of opportunities to volunteer, so make sure that uh, you take advantage of that. Certainly check in, queuing, all these are um, things that anybody can do. Uh, referee score tracking, again, you just use an iPad and sit on the side of the field. It's a very important role. And then there's a lot of opportunities when it comes to the league championship and your opportunity to then volunteer as a uh, judge as well. So that's very important. So you will, out of the league championship, you will advance to the state championship. And um, the number of teams that advance will be dependent upon the number of leagues that we have in the state. So uh, we will know that here within the next week. And 
let's see. Oh, state championship. So it's in Rala. It's on March 5th. So if you qualify out of the league championship to advance, you would go there. It is just like any other uh, league, league championship. So you would have judging, you would have field play, and out of that, we will determine advancement to Worlds and uh, the number of teams that advance out of Missouri, Kansas City is still being determined based on registrations, which are coming in now. And then the Worlds are in late April. Again, lots of opportunity to go with your team and volunteer in Arala as well. Uh, World Championships, big deal. It's over a course of several days. It's in Houston, Texas. Um, it's thousands of kids from around the world. It's an event that you will always remember if you go. Yep, there's the big competition field for the finals. And um, again, I have volunteered down there as, as other people have. It's a great place to go and work and see other teams from around the world. All right. All right, thank you, Bill. Frenzy. Next up, we've got our head referee, Colin. You will normally see him wearing stripes, so it's a little strange today that he's in like a dark polo, but we'll I, let it go. This I time. look sort of official, but not nearly as official enough. Yeah, so. no whistle. No whistle, or, well, I don't know. It's fine. Um, Brian, can you see our robot? No. No, go ahead. So, um, but we'll bear. Nope. I'm not going to keep it in the shot. I just want to And now lift the robot up to about just like Oh, okay. <laughs> so there, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll run control it to the screen. Okay, well, I want to get, okay. I'll, I'll bring it in when I need it, so. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Colin Robinette. I am the head referee, oops, sorry. I'm the head referee for uh, Western Missouri and Kansas. Uh, my third year uh, doing this, it's a great time. So I'm here to talk about uh, kind of how the game works and how competition works uh, from the referee's perspective. So. Uh, we're going to be going through a bit of like how the actual game works and a bunch of rules that I want to cover that for this year, specifically for Freight Frenzy, are going to be kind of tricky. And uh, there's a lot of rules that are similar, a lot of rules that we haven't seen in a couple of years, and uh, a bunch of stuff that just want to make sure we cover. So uh, you can see right here a bunch of the game pieces. Uh, we'll get into uh, more detail in a little bit, but it's good to kind of see those up, up close if you haven't seen them yet. So you got your shipping hubs, your shared shipping hub the barriers before the warehouses in the corners, the carousels, and then all of your freight game pieces, including rubber ducks, which I'm very happy about. So, just one way, go one way, okay. First thing I always wanna cover when I'm talking to teams, read both of the manuals. Um, all of the rules are gonna be in there, especially this early in the season. It's really good to understand how the, uh, excuse me, how the manuals work, how they're uh, laid out, where all the rules are at, and what you need to know to build your robot. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there that if you're thinking about it and you haven't read the rules all the way, that can be very confusing and could mess up your robot if you're trying to build for a rule that doesn't exist or it's worded improperly, because it can be kind of complicated. So look at those, have someone that knows how the rules works. If you have multiple team members, coaches, mentors that know how the rules are laid out, it's always gonna be more helpful when you get to competition to know where those rules are if something comes up. Um, rules updates. So there haven't been a lot yet, it's still very early in the season, but uh, whenever we're looking for rulings on the field, we're going to be going from first uh, any blog updates from the FTC forum, then any official team updates that will get uh, updated into the manual, but it will also be in a separate file on the FTC website, and then, then the game manual as it's written. Uh, always check those. We've had rules changes, we've had scoring changes, in between competitions, so it's always good to know before you go what to expect. Um, when we're there, we'll, all, we'll go over the rules during the driver's meeting very early in the day or very early in the competition, but it's always good to know, especially if you need to ask questions. Always ask questions. It's okay to ask too many questions. Get as many questions as you want so you're right when you get to the field. When you get to the field, there's a couple things me as a referee am looking for. First of all, you need to wear safety glasses. Uh, you know, it is robots, there's big, or metal, could be stuff flying around, intentionally or not. We want to make sure everyone's safe. So safety glasses and closed toed, closed heel shoes when you're coming to the field. Um, there's tripping hazards, there's robots moving around, there's a bunch of stuff, and it's kind of crowded. 
So I want to make sure that you guys are protected when you come out here. The other thing, walk, please walk. Don't jump, don't run. Uh, there's, like I said, there's tripping hazards all over the place. We just want people to be careful. I really don't want to see anyone get hurt at one of these. We haven't had it happen yet. Actually, I've hurt myself in that, but don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> were you running? No, don't worry about it. No, I wasn't running. Uh, anyways, back on track. Um, let's talk a little bit how the referees and scorekeepers work. There is a bit of a stigma around referees being really intimidating. And I get it. They're the people that are, you know, making, enforcing the rules. They look intimidating. I personally look really intimidating when I'm watching uh, competitions. I'm not trying to be, I'm not angry. I just look that way. And sometimes people are like that. And that's okay. Uh, but we, I just want to be clear that we're not there to, we're not there to uh, just dish out penalties and give people as many penalties as we want. We're there to make sure everyone plays fair and everyone gets to do the things that they want to do with their robot and be as successful as possible. That's what we're there to do. We just want to make sure everyone does it fairly. So just keep that in mind. Uh, we're, we're having as much fun as you guys are. Like I, I always say I have the best seat in the house minus the teams. It's a great time. So uh, I just really enjoy seeing what you guys get to make. So we just want to see what you guys can do. So, um, but just a couple things for what we're actually doing. We are getting penalties and we're making sure things are scored correctly as the referees. We'll be in our zebra shirts standing in one of the corners. Usually me as head referee, I'll be wandering around making sure everyone's okay. Uh, the scorekeepers, We'll be keeping live scores probably on an iPad. Um, in years past, we'll be probably similar this year. They've been sitting in the Alliance stations, right in the middle, so they have an easy shot to look at the field and make sure that they can see everything and they can score everything properly. Big thing is we just wanna make sure we get help. You guys get the points you, are, you have earned. That's all we're here for, right? So uh, just keep that in mind when we're working. We're, we're here to, we're, I don't know what I'm saying. We're here to help you, right? So uh, at the end of the match, uh, what we've done in the past, and I assume we'll do it again, is our scorekeepers will confirm with the teams before they leave that the scores match what they actually scored. If there's any discrepancy, it's good to get it right when you guys see it, right at the end of the match, then walking away, coming back 15 minutes later, and remembering something because there's a rule that you guys missed or something. We can do that, but only after about three or so matches. Otherwise, it, we have to move past it. We're not gonna have time. So um, try and get everything figured out when you're there, Otherwise, uh, you know, ask questions, but we want to make sure we get it right as quickly as we can. So, um, same thing though, if you ever have any questions at all, ask for help. We are there to help you. We want you guys to have fun. We want you guys to learn. We want you guys to score as many points as you can. Uh, usually there will be a question box uh, near some of the judging or scoring tables. Uh, that's a great place to find me so I can answer those questions, especially from the field. Look for those, or just ask a volunteer. They will get you to the right person, guaranteed. Next slide, okay. So, uh, this is a good reason why I brought uh, 6547 Cobalt Colts' robot. Uh, it's gonna be a very good example for a couple things that I need to make sure you guys have on your robot when you come to the field, and when you're on the field. First thing is the team number. We need to know what team you're on. We wanna you know, show off what team you're actually on. So, we look at the Colts' robot, we got a big number whoops, right on the side, two and a half inch tall uh, lettering at least numbering, and on two sides. It's kind of hard to see, but hopefully you can see that. You have it on at least two sides of your robot, and it can be made out of wood, plastic, 3D print them, uh, laminate them with, pl or with plastic. That's what the cobalt coals have done here. They just have a piece of paper on some plexiglass. Works great. The big thing that we want to make sure that we know with that one and for the markers, I'll get to in a second, is that they don't fall off. They're robust. I guarantee if you put a piece of paper and you tape it to the side with a roll of tape, it will fall off. We will have problems. If we can tell that your, uh, your numbers or your markers are going to fall off, we're going to have a problem. I can't let you compete without those. We need to make sure we can see which teams are doing what during the match. We need that for scoring. We need that for penalties. So please make sure you have that. The other big thing, which a lot of teams may have forgotten in the last couple years, are the alliance markers, which are either a red square or a blue circle. If you're on the red alliance, you have the red square. If, you have a, if you're on the blue alliance, you have the blue circle. Pretty straightforward. Those markers need to be within three inches of your numbers on your robot. So if we're looking at the Colts robot again, I'm trying to be really careful. Anywhere above the number is good. Anywhere on the side, 
It needs to be on that same side, but it needs to be on the other side as well. So make sure that if you have it, whoop, I'm sorry, hope it's okay. Hopefully, if you got your number on there, it stays on and we can visibly see it from, I think 12 feet away is what it says in the rules. Make sure it's visible. Um, both of these markers are really easy wins for rookies, for teammates that maybe don't have a whole lot of experience, for students that wanna get involved, right? This doesn't need a whole lot of work. It doesn't need to be super complicated. It can be laminated paper. It can be plastic. It can be 3D printed if you have the uh, capability to do that. I highly recommend it if you can. But uh, There's a lot of ways to do this. There's no one right answer. You just need to make sure it's at least two and a half inches tall for everything and you can see it. So uh, remember, you know, have those with you. Um, have them on the robot. It's a good thing if they're permanent fixtures on the robot uh, so that you don't lose them or you don't have to keep multiple markers. Um, one recommendation I have is that if you can make it double-sided for the markers, so you have one is red, one on, on one side is red and the other side is blue and you just flip them around uh, with like some sort of slot, I think that's a great idea. So there's no wrong answers as long as it stays on the robot before the match and during the match. If it falls off, we're gonna have a problem. So keep that in mind. Just remember that when you guys are building your robot, you can get a lot further just to know that you have that on there. Okay, so let's talk about how the match works. Uh, the match uh, in general is both really slow and really, really fast. So keep that in mind when you're coming here. So the way the match works is once you guys are ready to come up to the field, you roll your robots up, you bring them up, you put them on the, on the field this year against the walls, not in the warehouse, closest to your Alliance station. We'll show that in a picture in a, a slide or two. Uh, once everyone is ready and set, the MC, the announcer, will randomize the field, uh, specifically this year to figure out where the game piece will be on barcodes. Uh, and field reset will move those pieces on the barcode. Uh, once you guys set your robots, it's hands off until the end of autonomous, except for starting autonomous. Uh, so just remember that. So the entire match time from when we say go to when the buzzer hits is two minutes and 38 seconds. That's it. Uh, once we're ready, the MC will go three, two, one, go. At that point, you guys can start your autonomous mode. That's the pre-programmed mode of your robots. It's hands off, except for starting the autonomous mode button and your robot does your thing. This is a really, really good opportunity to score easy points. Just doing some simple movements with your robot. Parking, scoring, uh, recognizing the barcode, all of those should be very doable uh, if you have a program set up. So um, that whole period is only 30 seconds. As soon as that's done, uh, there's gonna be an eight second setup period that is going to be controlled by the computer. Announcers aren't gonna say anything, refs aren't gonna say anything. Uh, during that time, the referees and the scorekeepers will be making sure scores are good, but we're not telling you three, two, one, go. The computer will say it. There will normally be a monitor with the timer on it. It'll say three, two, one, go, and you'll hear it from them. So pay attention to that. I've had a lot of teams get confused when to start because they weren't listening, so just be careful. Uh, the last two minutes of the match are the driver control period. That's when you're physically picking up your controllers, driving around, scoring more points with your robots by hand. Uh, the last 30 seconds of that driver control period is the end game. There's a lot of specific scoring opportunities that can only happen during that time. If it, you do it before then, you could incur a major penalty. Or big penalties, not a, well, a major and a minor, well, I'll get to it. Uh, so just remember that, that there is a specific timing and there will be like a buzzer time or a sounder, probably not a buzzer, like the Flintstones foot movement or something like that, uh, for when that end game starts. At the end of the end game, there will be a large buzzer. By the end of the buzzer, which lasts a second or so, robots need to stop moving, you need to put your controllers down and the entire field will go silent, basically. At that point, the refs and the scorekeepers are gonna count stuff, especially this year, there's gonna be a lot of game pieces to uh, count up, made a lot of scoring places. We'll count those up, the scorekeepers will record those, they'll check with the teams, and then we will finalize the score. At that point, you're allowed to come onto the field, take your robots off, and we'll do the next match. Okay, so specifically this year, for 2021-2022, er, for, uh, Free Frenzy is the game. Here are the uh, layouts for the game. Uh, you can get much better description than what I'm saying uh, if you read the manuals and watch the game animation. Uh, but just a couple of real things, or quick things real quick. Uh, a lot of it is going to be 
starting, uh, your robots are starting on these walls and your red alliance are starting on the red wall, blue alliance is starting on the left blue wall. Doing autonomous, reading the barcodes, these guys right here, uh, scoring into the shipping hubs, only your aligned shipping hub or the shared shipping hub, not an autonomous though, we'll get to that. Uh, going into the warehouse, uh, picking up game pieces, scoring them into the hubs or the storage unit. There's a variety of points for those depending on where you score them. The higher the uh, location is you score, the more points you'll get. Uh, and you got the carousels in the bottom corner for delivering ducks during autonomous or during the end game. Again, I'm going to do a, a clarification on some of the points when we get to those slides. Uh, but yeah, and then your aligned stations that where you'll be physically standing are over on the sides in taped areas. Uh, we'll probably have a TV tray or some sort of stand you can put your controllers and your uh, driver hub or driver phone on, uh, as well as where you can stand during the duration of the match. Okay, so let's go into some more of the specific rules because I think I, this year there's a couple of ways that if you don't understand the rules properly, there's a good chance you might screw up. We really want to make sure that you guys don't incur penalties, especially this year because penalties are massive. Uh, in years past, uh, we would have penalties be added to the uh, opposing alliance score. That is not the case this year. This year, it is subtracted from your own score. And given rankings for competitions, for meets, for qualifiers, for championships are all determined by your points that you scored during the match, losing those points is going to be very detrimental to your score. Especially this year where a minor penalty is 10 points, it'll take you at least a couple of uh, game piece scores to just break even. A major penalty is 30 points. One of the highest scoring opportunities is 15 points. You'd have to do that twice just to overcome one major penalty, just to break even. So it's really important this year not to do that. Uh, for warehouse operations specifically, um, this year you can only have one game piece at a time. By game piece, I mean freight. So the blocks, the balls, uh, boxes or uh, cargo, or the ducks, called the ducks. Uh, you can only have one of those at a time. You can also have your uh, team specific game element on your robot as well at the same time, but that's it. If you are moving parts out or game pieces out of the warehouse, the taped in white area, you have to completely go into the warehouse. So that means your entire robot has to be in the warehouse before you can grab anything. You have to grab your piece, come completely out of the warehouse, and then you can score. In years past with very similar game pieces, you were able to reach over into the area, grab pieces, and score. That's not the case this year. You have to make sure your entire robot is all the way over or across this white tape. It can be on the tape, but it can't be in this outer area at all, or else we can't count it. And you currently incur penalties if you don't do it properly from GS5. That's the specific rule in the manual that you can look up for that rule. Uh, so yeah, to be really careful when you're doing that. Uh, and it'll, you know, when you're running it, it'll, you'll be going in and out multiple times if that's how you're scoring uh, during the entire match. So keep that in mind, especially keep in mind your barriers that you'll be going over for the most part uh, when you're moving. If you don't, if your robot is not uh, small enough to go through that 13.7 inch gap, 75 inch gap, you will have to go over it to score any, or to get anything out of the warehouse. So keep that in mind when you're designing robots. Uh, the other confusing rule or uh, process this year is delivering the ducks from the carousel. So you can deliver a duck from the carousel in autonomous, which is worth a lot of points, but you can only deliver the one duck that starts on the carousel at the start of the match. Teammates cannot touch the ducks until the end game. Or, yeah, pretty sure that's correct. You can't move the carousel in the driver control period, only during autonomous or the end game. That could be a major penalty, that's 30 points. Delivering the duck is only six. So you see, you know, messing that up could be very costly, so be careful. If you're moving the carousel and during the end game and you have one of your team members putting ducks on, the way this has to work is the carousel has to be stopped. You can put the duck on at that point and then the robot can spin the carousel around until it comes around to the back side of the sweeper plate and the duck falls off. If the duck goes on to the field of play, congratulations, you scored the points. You can do it again. But the team still can't put another, or another duck on until the first duck is off and the carousel stops moving. 
So you can't just have your robot go up there, spin it forever, and get all the points. You have to stop it and start it again. Keep that in mind. That's good there. So um, there's a bunch of other wordings that are uh, kind of contentious this year that we need to make sure we uh, remember that. Like I said uh, a second ago, you can only move the carousel during autonomous or during the end game. First 30 seconds, last 30 seconds. You can't place ducks until that last bit. You can't, or yeah, the team members can't interact with ducks or shipping elements during autonomous. You can't interact with them during drive control period, but you can't spin the carousel during the end game. That's weird, but that's how the rule works. So, uh, the shared shipping hub cannot be touched during autonomous at all. Cannot be interacted with it in any way. So if you're thinking about scoring during autonomous, it doesn't work and you will incur a penalty on GS3C specifically. Be careful with that one. Uh, one other thing that we should talk about is completely in versus not completely in or just in. So when I was talking about the warehouse a couple slides ago, this tape was included in that. If there's ever a tape section, it's always included in the area. So this warehouse includes the tape. So we're going to be looking at this outer line when we're talking about in versus completely in. If your robot's in here, it's completely in. If your robot's here and you have one corner or one wheel or an arm sticking out, it's only in. For autonomous and for the end game, that's different amounts of points. So be careful that when you're placing your robots or when you're scoring an autonomous, scoring the end game, make sure you have enough time to get in this area. This area is 43 inches. Your robot can only be 18 at the start of the game. So that's plenty of room to get in there. But that tape is what we're going to be looking at, this outer edge. Same thing goes for the, uh, the name of the storage unit. Same thing for there. Uh, you can score game pieces in the storage unit for one point apiece. But if they're out, or if they're across the line, they're not completely in. And they only can be completely in to be scored. Uh, and on the uh, shipping hubs, the blue and red ones right in the middle of the field. Uh, same thing, they can only be, they have to be completely on, and that means only supported by the shipping hub. If for some reason you have a block leaning up against it, it doesn't count. It has to be completely supported by it for it to count. Um, other thing with the shipping hubs is you can't move them. They have to, you can't intentionally move them. You can't move them into the storage unit to score double points. That's not how that works. Uh, you can, grazed by it, that's perfectly fine. They're not attached, so they can be moved, but it will incur a major penalty to do that. Um, so just be careful with that. Uh, last, last couple of things are, uh, the shipping hub can be in a lot of variations when uh, it's scored upon, and it will tilt, and that's what it's supposed to do. Um, depending on how it's tilted and where it's touching on the ground, we'll score more points or less points. Uh, there's a couple of ways that that could lose points depending on how the robot is interacting with it or how game pieces are interacting with it. Um, basically, any robot touching a shipping uh, shipping hub at the end of the game won't score any bonus points because it's being supported by the robot. Um, same thing with the shared shipping hub. It works the same way. You, in fact, you'll score it for the other team if you're interacting with it at the end of the game. Like you're contacting it to push it down on your side, for example. Uh, last... I had one other thing I wanted to talk about. Oh yeah, so those examples are in Appendix E. There's in the in Game Manual Part Two. There's a bunch of valuable pictures back there that you can use for examples. Take a look at that if you can. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes, Glenn. How are you going to decide whether a shipping hub is balanced or not balanced, and whether it's balanced to blue or red if it's the uh, shared? So uh, it should be visual. So I'm planning on getting down there and looking to see if there's any gaps, right? Um, I want to say I'll do a paper test, but I don't know if that's the official way to do that. Um, that would be my go-to. If, if there's paper contacting, then it is touching. If not, then it's balanced. So, but it, the, the way it's considered balanced is if nothing is touching the floor on that outer rim. Okay. Uh, and then, yes. how much are teams going to be allowed to interact with the shipping hub? So, if I'm a team and I've gone in the warehouse and I've brought freight out and I want to put it on my shipping hub, can I bump my shipping hub a little bit when I'm delivering the freight, or am I really totally hands off? Bumping it is fine. Okay. So it is just, you cannot physically be, it, you can't use an action to move the shipping hub to another place. Okay. If you bump it accidentally, you bump it while you're scoring, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Um, a couple words that are really important for how we're gonna score things as referees is inadvertent and inconsequential. 
Inverted means you didn't mean to do it, and it didn't affect, or it didn't, you didn't mean to do it, right? Inconsequential means it didn't change the score. If those two things happen, there's a good chance we will benefit of the doubt, uh, score it, and give you the benefit of that score. Uh, if we think that you pushed your shipping hub all the way across the field and knocked bits out, that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a, a bunch of penalties. Uh, but again, if you're driving by it and there's a bit of a traffic jam and you end up bumping something and nothing really happens, that's perfectly fine. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking about how you're moving around the field because there is a lot of maneuvering you would probably need to do this year and especially with those uh, barriers are going to make it more difficult to move around. So keep that in mind when you're coming up with the robot designs. Any other questions? You didn't talk a whole lot about the team shipping elements. Do you want to cover that just a little bit? I would love to cover the team shipping element. So the team shipping element is a game piece that your team will make and bring to the field. Uh, I will need to double check the exact sizing on it, but the big thing is that it needs to have your team number on it. Uh, because if you leave it on the field, we need to make sure we get it back to you, or we'll keep it as a trophy. So uh, that is going to be, there's a couple things that the team shipping unit does. So you can either have it start on the field, on the barcode, instead of, actually here, let me go back to the picture. Uh, you can have your team shipping element starting on the barcode instead of a dock, or you can have it starting in your loading dock on the outside of the field, and you can basically treat it as a duck later in the match. If you, I, I highly recommend making a shipping uh, element and using it during autonomous if you can, and during the end game if you can. I recommend having it anyways. Uh, you will score more points if you uh, score onto the shipping hub with your. Uh, your game piece that will be contained in your robot at the start of the match, it's the block with an X on it. Um, so this is one of the boxes. There's a bunch of different variations of boxes. Uh, this one has weights in it. Uh, this one has the most weights in it. There are some boxes that only have one on them. Uh, but the box that you'll start with at the start of the match have no weights in them and will have an X on them, just in Sharpie. That box will start in your robot or possessed by your robot and that's what you need to score on the shipping hub or in the storage unit to score bonus points. If you match the barcode uh, level with what the barcode tells you to score it on, you'll get a bunch more points. And you'll get even more points if you have your shipping unit or shipping element on the field when you do that. At the end game, you can, you can cap the uh, shipping hubs with your uh, uh, el get shipping element. Dang, I keep forgetting the name of that one. The shipping element. Uh, that one will just go put right on top of a pole. Um, again, there's a lot of pictures in Appendix E that are really valuable to look at for those. Uh, it's like about 15 points. It's one of the best ways to score points if you can do it. Um, but it could affect how it's balanced at the end of the game, so just keep that in mind. One thing that I want to make sure people know, you can score a shipping unit on top of another shipping unit. Both teams can score their shipping unit on the shipping hub. Just think about that when you're designing your shipping unit shipping element for playing with. So uh, yeah, there's a bunch of things you can do with your shipping element to make the game uh, you know, easier, but check the rules again, especially for inspection, to make sure that you're doing everything properly when you make those. But it's a worth a lot of points and it's definitely worth doing. Is there any major things I left out? I don't think so. I think I covered a lot. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have any other rules questions, you can email Phil. You can email Casey Stem, First in Missouri, any of those, and you will get it to either us or check the forums. There's a bunch of people that might have the exact same question that you do, and they may have already answered it on the forum, so that's a good place to check. Team updates, rule book, uh, exact definitions, because there's just a bunch of definitions for what things are in the game manual. That's very, very useful. Keep those in mind if you have any other questions. And we might still answer some with the rest of this video. So thank you for your time, and uh, I'll hand it back up to Glenn. All right. Thank you, Colin. Appreciate all the detail about judging and uh, referee. Or, sorry, referee. Um, it is a really tricky thing figuring out the rules for the game. It's hard for teams. It's hard for the refs at the first competition. And so we're gonna, you know, it's all volunteers. So when you get to your first meet and people aren't really sure what the rules are, both the teams and the people who are doing score tracking and stuff like that. It'll, it'll all get sorted out. Um, everybody's doing a great job, and uh, by the time you get to your league championship, we'll all have a really great understanding of the whole thing. We're all volunteers. We're all volunteers. So remember, like, nobody's making a bunch of money on this. 
Um, okay, hi, I'm Glenn Crocker again, um, and I'm gonna cover a bunch about team activities. Team activities falls into um, several different areas. Uh, there are different kinds of strategy that are involved. Uh, there's how you organize your team. You gotta build a robot. Ideally, you do a bunch of outreach, documentation. You're gonna have to do a presentation, like it or not. Um, and looping in a bunch of mentors is really helpful for your team. Uh, so your coach remains sane and so the kids are getting the most as, uh, most possible out of the experience and also so that the mentors are getting an opportunity to work with exciting kids. And then the last thing, do not forget to have fun. If you're taking this too seriously, you're probably not really quite doing all of this stuff right. So at the beginning we talked about gracious professionalism. Remember these things are really kind of touchstones for if, you're, if, you're, if you feel like what you're doing isn't aligned with this, do some, some you know, introspection and see if you can figure out how to adjust. Okay, let's talk first about game strategy for Freight Frenzy. Every year there's a fresh game, every year we have to look at the game and figure out how to approach it. Um, but a lot of these are general skills and general approaches that you'll find will work well year over year. Figure out your goals early on. If you're a coach, you need to understand your team's individual, your team members' goals. If you wanna go to state, and they're just messing around and having fun in a classroom, you're not going to stay. So figure out your goals early on. If you're a coach and you really wanna just kinda of take it easy and you've got a bunch of super competitive kids who wanna to go to state, you've got a mismatch. And again, if we go back to these ideas of gracious professionalism, you, you may need to figure out how to communicate well about those goals. Those goals are gonna inform everything else you do, right? Time commitment, balance between robotics and other activities, all the rest of that stuff. Fundraising, outreach, everything. Um, as Colin mentioned, there are a ton of ways to score points this year. There are also a ton of ways to lose points. Oh, Colin, I did have one more question. Can yes, scores absolutely. go negative? As far as I know, no. Okay, we think zero is the lowest possible score. Some years it's not that way, so I bet we'll find out at the first meet. Um, but yeah, lots of, lots of potential penalties. Um, I wanna talk first about a great way that my team uh, approaches games, and that is Human Robot. Human Robot this year works like this. We get four kids, and we put them on the field, and we say, you are Robot 1, Blue Alliance. You are Robot 2, Red Alliance, Blue Alliance. And then we've got two robots on the Red Alliance. We give each kid one of these grabby grabbers, and they use the grabbers, you can't see it, but they use the grabbers to grab the scoring elements like a robot would and score them. We run the timer, we have the team talk with their alliance partner about, we're gonna do autonomous, we wanna go to here in autonomous, or I wanna go to here in autonomous, what are you doing? All of that. In end game, we spin the ducks. All of those kinds of things. That is the best way I've found to get everybody up to speed on all of the game rules because it's one thing to sort of have Game Manual 2 around in your shop and hope that somebody might read it. And it's another to put four kids on a field and, and they've got that peer pressure of, okay, I want to score points and not look like a fool. So now they're looking at Game Manual 2 and trying to figure out what they're allowed to do and why. So Human Robot, great way to figure out early on in the season what the game really is and uh, how you got to approach it. Then prioritize points you, your team can get. If you have a super sophisticated team that can do tons of programming and has access to lots of sensors and an amazing shop, you can probably get all the points, or you know, they're all at least possible for you. If you're a rookie team that just got a kit of parts and you're wondering how to put it together, it's gonna be really hard to get some of those points. So don't try to score the hardest points early on in the season. Prioritize early points and come up with a roadmap for how you can approach the season. This isn't FRC. FRC is six weeks of madness. No one sleeps. It's crazy pants. It's a sprint. FTC is a marathon. So approach it that way, especially if it fits your team's goals, um, and try to have a November bot at your first meet that's maybe pretty simple. Score some points, works reliably, had some fun building it, and then maybe your February bot is doing everything on the field and you've got all kinds of really cool parts on it. Easy points early on. Autonomous parking, you get three points for the simplest autonomous in the world, right? Just drive forward for a little ways and stop. You get 10 points for, uh, for the same autonomous as long as you test it twice. Um, in Endgame, if you're able to spin the little carousel thing and get ducks on the field, you get six points per duck. That's a lot of points early on. For a November bot, if you can spin ducks, 
you're going to win half your matches. Um, end game. If your shipping hub is capped with your team specific scoring element, it has a better element. name. Yeah. Your what? Shipping element. Your shipping element. If your team specific shipping element is on top of your shipping hub, 15 points. That's those are big points this year, especially if you're not getting any penalties. And then end game parking. Really just drive your robot to the right place at the right time. Now what that means is you've got to have your team coach who's there on your drive team aware of time. So they've got to know it's 30 seconds till the end of the match, get over into the warehouse, get down to the other place that Colin and I can't remember the name of, all that. Okay. Then think about how you'll work with your Alliance partner bot. That's another good example of why human robot works really well. If I'm Blue Alliance number one and you're Blue Alliance number two, how are we going to be on this, in this space at the same time and accomplish as much as we can. So finding out ways to do that, really important. More important, being aware that that's going to happen. A lot of teams kind of play solitaire and they have, what in, they have in mind what they want to do, but they don't have in mind whether that's compatible with what their partner is going to want to do. So you may need to have multiple, you will need to have multiple autonomouses. So if you've got an auton that drives to the warehouse and you're really proud of it, and your partner has a, an auton that also drives to the warehouse and you run a, a risk of colliding, you may want to drive to somewhere else instead just to play it safe. Another great thing to do when you get to a competition is driver practice. Now meets may not have a practice field available, but normally at a league championship or state, you're going to have a practice field available. If your robot is in your pit, not being driven, that is a wasted opportunity. You should have your robot on the practice field. Just drive it. Just drive it with other robots, figure out what problems come up, keep some batteries charged, drive, drive, drive. It's the best thing you can do. So that's a bunch of game strategy. And game is actually not the top way to advance from your league championship to state or from state to world. The top way to advance is with awards, judged awards. So thinking about, again, back to your team's goals. Do you want to go to state or are you just having fun and we're just kind of relaxed and, and taking it easy? If you want to go to state, you probably need to be thinking about these things and have some strategy around how you're going to approach awards. FTC has a bunch of different awards, which is really great. If your team is super artistic, there's some awards that may be great, a great fit for you. If your team is really strong on outreach, there's some other awards that are great for you. So look at those and understand, here are our goals, here are our competencies, here are the awards that kind of overlap with those, and chase those. Be really clear with your judges when you're presenting that those are kind of those are the things you're focused on. Um, I'll show a list of awards in a second. Um, Dean's list. So almost all awards in first are team awards. Kind of goes back to that notion of gracious professionalism and all of the core values. Almost all of the core values are community-oriented core values. They're not individual things. But there's one award in first that is an individual award, and that's Dean's list. That's for sophomores or juniors. They're typically nominated by their team. And then that nomination, uh, they are judged individually in an interview process. And then they can advance through that. So Dean's List. Then there are two video submissions that you can do as well. One is Promote. There will be a question of the year. I don't know if it's out yet, which is essentially um, you know, whatever it is that first is interested in you answering about uh, how you're building your robot, how your team works, how you relate to your community, and you make about a one minute video about that. Make sure that your video uh, has copyright clear music on it. Um, you don't want to put copyrighted music in there or you won't be counted. Uh, the second award is Compass. Compass is a video award again, about a minute long, and it's about a mentor that's involved with your team that you find inspiring. Doesn't have to be your head coach. It can be somebody else that's just inspiring. It could be Rory. All right, it can't be Rory. Okay, um, I mentioned before the different awards that we can talk about. So again, as you're looking at advancement, the first team that advances from a competition to the next competition is not the winning robot. It is not the captain of the winning alliance. It is not the winning alliance. It has nothing to do, it doesn't have nothing to do with it. It is not the winning robot. The, the first team to, to advance wins the Inspire Award. The Inspire Award is essentially an award for teams that really would have done well at multiple of these. They had a good robot, they had good outreach, their documentation was strong, all of that. They're kind of the complete picture, right? So Inspire, the top Inspire Award winner is the first team to advance to the next level. Then the winning world, then the captain of the winning alliance. 
then the Think Award, removing engineering obstacles through creative thinking. I think of the Think Award as being a documentation award. That's not exactly accurate, but if you're doing an amazing job on engineering, being creative, and then documenting your process, you're kind of aligning yourself with the Think Award. Connect Award. This is for teams that are interacting really well with your community. If you're working with a company to manufacture some parts for your robot, and you've brought some engineers in to speak with your team about what they do in their career, and you've done a tour of a factory, you are aligning your team really well with the Connect Award. Next one down, the Innovate Award. This is a tough one. Um, if you look at um, Team 3409 Astromax, one thing they try to do every season is have just basically something on their robot that's not gonna be on anybody else's robot. They wanna have something super creative. One year they had a crazy scoop thing that the first time you look at it, you're like, that is not the best idea in the world. And then you watch it drive and you're like, that may be the best idea in the world. And that aligns their team really well with the Innovate Award. Control Award. If you focus a lot on sensors and programming and autonomous behavior and having the software support your drivers so they don't have to do as much work during teleop, things like that, then the Control Award is a separate form that you fill out so you say, we are interested in the control award. You document what amazing stuff you're doing to figure out where on the barcodes your team specific shipping element is. I got it right, Colin said I got it right. Um, then you are aligning yourself with the control award. Motivate. The Motivate Award is for teams that are doing a lot of outreach in their community to spread the culture of first. If your FTC team starts two FLL teams and spends several hours each week mentoring them, you're aligning really well with the Motivate Award. And the last one is back to those folks that I mentioned earlier uh, who have sort of an art design idea. Um, if you're doing an amazing job of building a beautiful robot that uh, represents your kind of team's brand and your identity, and it's super interesting, and ideally also performs really well. So, you know, imagine Astromex, they've got that really cool scoop, and then it also just happens to have a shape that's specific to their team. That's the kind of thing that judges might look at and say, ooh, design award. A few over here. So again, these are the big guys, and these are basically in order of, this isn't in order of difficulty exactly, but I think it is in terms of advancement. So for advancement, Inspire Award winner, then the top robot. Think Award winner, second place robot. Connect Award, third place robot. Innovate Award, and so on down. So it sort of alternates between a judged award and a robot performance on the field. There's often a lot of overlap there. A team that's really amazing at think or control probably scored really well, and they may advance on the robot before they advance on judging. So there's, and because of the overlap, the list can sometimes go pretty low as advancement goes. Other awards, promote. This is the one we talked about earlier with the compelling video message for the public. The idea is essentially you're making a commercial for first. Uh, Compass Award, you're doing similar, but you're recognizing a coach or mentor. Judge's Choice. I always love the Judge's Choice on the issue. It's not at every event, but when they have it, it's because there was a team that did not quite align with any of these things over here, but they did something so amazing that the judges are like, we can't send them home empty-handed. We've got to give them something. And so the judges award is always for some weird thing that you're like, oh, maybe we should have another award down here for that, but not yet. And then Dean's List we talked about earlier, that's for 10th and 11th, uh, sorry, 10th and 11th grade students. Um, when, when I've been at the World Championship, I've been in the elevator maybe three times. You get in, I've got my team, they've got all my shirts on and all that, and there's one random kid. And you're like talking to the random kid, or my kids are talking to the random kid, and it'll usually come out that random solo kid is there as a Dean's List uh, finalist. So they, they're at the World Championship. Sometimes the rest of their team didn't advance. They're the best kids. Every time you're like, oh my god, I'm a cool kid. All right, next up. We have a small group here, so any questions so far? Any stuff you feel like I missed? All right. Colin gives me two thumbs up, not just one. All right, team structure. There are as many ways to structure teams as there are teams. Everyone's going to be unique. There's not a roadmap here. There's not a pattern that's this is the best way or this is the only way. It kind of goes back to that question I talked about earlier of goals, right? So you need to understand your goals, the coach's goals, the team member's goals, maybe parent goals, um, other mentor goals. So who is the coach? If the coach is a teacher, that's gonna push the whole team in one direction. 
If the coach is an engineer, that's gonna push the team in a direction. Just a, just a parent, right? Somebody who doesn't have an engineering background or any of that kind of stuff, that's gonna, that's gonna change the character of the team and the structure of the team. You are enough. Don't worry, whoever you are, it's okay. You can do this. Um, including teams kind of without a coach, where there's basically a, an adult that signs the paperwork and the kids do everything, that's okay too. Another way to look at team structure is top down versus bottom up. So does the coach set the path and say, here's what we're gonna do, this is the lesson plan, this is how we're gonna build the robot, these are the parts that we need, get to work on these. Or do the team members say, I wanna build this thing, I have an idea, I don't know if it'll really fit on the robot, but I wanted to try to pick up the cube in a certain way, or I wanted to do something funny with the duck, or whatever. Um, that's more of a bottom up approach. Both approaches can work. Both approaches are successful every year. Captains, does your team have captains? Does your team have a captain who kind of sets the tone for the team and says this is what we're gonna do, here's how to behave, those sorts of things? Do you have a captain for each area? Maybe you have an outreach captain, a documentation captain, a robot captain, and a driving captain, a programming captain. Um, there are lots of roles that you can have there and kind of put that captain hat on somebody. That lets the other team members know, if I have a question about this aspect of what we're doing as a team, or if I'm interested in getting more involved with that, I can go to that person who, who occupies that role. But a lot of teams have no captains at all. They're more of a flat, agile structure where there's not really a hierarchy, and that can be successful as well. This all goes back to goals, coach identity, team identity. Drive it that way and you'll probably be happier. You do need to set a balance between FTC and school or grades. Most teams um, are gonna be, you know, school is first, grades are first. Uh, if you've got a big test tomorrow, don't show up for the meeting, that kind of thing. Um, that's how we do things, and I would recommend that. Uh, but if you want, if your goal, if the coach's goal and everybody on the team's goal is to be super competitive, maybe you need to manage those priorities and say to kids, all right, you've gotta keep your grades here in order to remain active on the team. And so there's some pressure there, um, but, but you can structure that lots of different ways. So this is all kind of setting the stage. Now when we talk about starting to actually get work done, what I find works well is to have short-term goals. We know we're gonna do these things in the next couple weeks. Um, a lot of teams use the Agile methodology. If you look that up, it's a pretty productive way to live. Um, and short-term goals are usually wrapped up in how teams do Agile. But if all you're looking at is your short-term goals, then you're just looking at your feet and moving forward and you don't really have a direction. So you also have to have kind of a roadmap for what we think we're gonna build is this, long-term. We don't need to build it tomorrow, but that's the direction we're going in. And that helps because then with Agile, every couple of weeks, you're looking up and saying, okay, did what we do align with where we think we're going? Did where we thought we were going change? That needs to be okay. Um, and are we getting stuff done well? Are we you know, getting along as a team? All those kinds of things. So I would recommend both of those things to you if you don't have another way you're doing things. But again, if you're a teacher and you've got a lesson plan and you've kind of got a, a rubric for how you're gonna run this semester, mm, ignore all that. You've, you've got a different plan and that's okay too. We just spent like 20 slides talking about all the stuff that to many of you is the boring stuff. So now we're gonna get into what many people are here for, which is how to build a robot. So I'm gonna wheel one over. This is our My King's robot from last year. Um, every year, as I mentioned earlier, is, is radically different. There's probably a picture of it. Yeah, it's this one over here. All right, I'll just use the laser then. Um, so every year there are common parts of every robot, right? What are they? The drivetrain. The drivetrain is essentially the stuff that touches the ground. This one uses tank tread. The one on the left uses tank treads driven by pulleys. The one second to left uses an older kind of mechanum wheel that was really effective. Uh, this bot with the scissor lift on it has mechanum wheels that are embedded in the sides. This one also has mechanum wheels, the newest generation of the GoBuilder mechanum wheels, which were really effective last year. Drivetrain. In this year's game for Freight Frenzy, a lot of teams are probably gonna build a relatively small drivetrain so they can get through that narrow area between the warehouse and the rest of the field. And other teams may build a drivetrain that has more of an, a suspension on them, shocks and things like that. And some teams may just, just yell YOLO and drive over the brick barricade and hope for the best. All of those can be successful. Um, intake. Every year, you're going to have to pick stuff up. This year, what do you got to pick up? You got to pick up the cubes, 
I don't know if you can see this well. You've got to pick up the cubes and the balls. Um, you should know that by now. You can also pick up the ducks. I think that's going to be pretty rare that teams pick up the ducks. Um, you can pick it up before end game, but there will only be one on the field. And during end game, you've probably just got one robot frantically trying to spin the turntable and, and get the ducks on the field. But uh, when we did human robot with the claw, we had one kid spinning the turntable, and another the, the, the kids had scored every freight that was available in the warehouses. And so at that point, they were over grabbing the ducks and scoring them. And actually, these worked really well on the high part of the shipping hub because they're nice and rubbery, so you can stack them on top of everything else. They're also very light. Ducks. Um, most years, you're going to have something that transfers from the intake to the outtake. If we look at these robots, this leftmost robot picked up foam cubes and then lifted them and dropped them in. So it didn't have a transfer. This robot also didn't have a transfer. It had an intake that was out here, and that was how we delivered. This robot has an intake here, this green wheel on the left, and then the, the uh, plastic rectangles, the, the building blocks came through the robot, and then they got stacked. So this one had a sort of transfer mechanism in the middle, and the transfer mechanism had wheels that were powered and pushed the block on through. This one's similar. It would do intake on this end, and then there was a transfer mechanism that, it's easier to see if I wheel it out, I think. Um, on this one, it does intake on the front here. I'm guessing you can maybe see that. And then the transfer is actually this crazy curved thing on the back of the robot. Uh, there's a bunch of pulleys. There's a bunch of pulleys, and um, uh, they're like paint rollers, basically, in there that move the thing up here before it got thrown. And then the last part is the outtake. You've got to deliver your scoring elements somewhere. So this year, you're going to pick up these balls. You're going to move them around, and then you got to put them somewhere. So those are the parts of that. Uh, nothing happens until it's programmed. So uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, a little bit more, but um, getting it all programmed is, is really key. Give your programmer a good week before driver practice, before a competition. So what that kind of means is, if you get your robot done and kind of locked down and stop making changes 10 days, 14 days before a competition, then your programmer will have enough time to get everything updated, and your drive team will have enough time to, to do driver practice. Uh, that makes the schedule for FTC really hard, but it's a really good best practice. Well, let's talk about the parts that we can use to build all of these intakes and drivetrains and all that. Um, you're probably, or you've probably already ordered parts from Tetrix, Rev, GoBuilda. Um, another one to look at if you haven't seen them yet is McMaster Car. They sell all kinds of industrial equipment, so if you need a weird screw, or if you're like, surely there's a thing that exists that's made of metal and does something, these guys sell it. Figuring out the name of it may be hard, but once you've got the name of the part, probably McMaster Car will sell it. Um, we get a lot of parts from Amazon as well. Um, whatever supplier works for you is cool. If you've got an industry partner that can help you with fabrication, I don't have a bot here like that, but. Uh, actually, this one on the screen, uh, this is CAD of it from a few years ago, but this top box, uh, the final version of it was made out of plexiglass, and it, we couldn't make it. Um, we cut one and, fa and fabricated it and folded it out of Lexan, and it was, it was an okay prototype. And then we took it to a fabrication company, and the owner said, yeah, we can't really help, sorry. And then an hour later he called back and he said, yeah, the guys on the shop floor found out that we got like a part for a robot team that, that you want made. And he was like, we, we, they basically stopped all work until I agreed to make this for you guys. So uh, reach out to your local companies and ask for support if you feel like you've gotten in over your heads and they'll be happy to help. I mean, these guys are basically making these screws that go in and like lock a house into a foundation so, so it doesn't settle, that kind of stuff super boring to make these every day and they're like oh robot parts for high school kids yes please so highly recommend it if you don't have a 3d printer um, you might put it on your roadmap maybe for next year maybe fundraise toward it ask parents to support it that kind of thing you can get an ender 3 pro um, for 200 250 dollars it is a great 3d printer it works very well you can print with pla plastic which is super easy to print with so you can CAD using Fusion 360 or PTC Onshape, both good solutions for CADing for teams, both free for students and teachers, mentors, coaches, whatever. Um, highly recommended. If we look at this robot on the right, 
the blue box stuff was laser cut at a partner. Um, everything else on it that's blue was 3D printed. If you look at this robot, I'll peel it back out. Um, everything on this that's blue was 3D printed. Uh, we had a variety of materials that we used, but little tiny fiddly parts for sensors, uh, battery holder over here, a switch guard so that your uh, competitor doesn't accidentally, accidentally turn your robot off. Um, crazy grabbers that we printed with a flexible filament that worked really well for some things. So highly, highly recommend 3D printing. The other thing that's great about it is it's fantastically cheap. The plastic is cheap. Kids learn a ton doing the CAD and they print it and then they look at it and they're like, that's not gonna work at all. We had a kid, we printed these, uh, we had these wheel guards on this one from last year. This is probably the fifth generation of these. Um, the first one just like, you'd look at it in CAD and you're like, this is obviously not gonna work. But I went ahead and printed it. And the kid tested it and he was like, that's obviously not gonna work. Correct. Then he got a Sharpie and he wrote the corrections on it. And then he went back to CAD, updated it. And we did that several more times. And each one, you know, costs 25 cents to print. And the kid's learning a ton. Really, really great way to go. The laser cutter is similar. If you have school access to a laser cutter, they are killer for prototyping. Um, the tank drive bot that was on the slide earlier, um, we printed the sides of that, or we cut the sides of that out of wood on a laser, which takes just a few minutes, mounted it up, saw that it had problems, literally took a pencil, wrote the notes on the piece of wood, updated the CAD, cut another one, and we did three generations of the sides of that robot in a three hour meeting. It was a great way to very rapidly innovate and understand what was going on. And all of that information flows really well into your engineering documentation for the Think Award and things like that. So really great, you know, low cost overall, highly effective. You're probably gonna need it, 3D printing. Highly recommend it. So a little more detail about drivetrain. So we talked earlier about this. At the bottom right you can see a, uh, this is the Go Build a Strafer chassis. They've got a deal. Um, you can enter basically a drawing uh, with Go Build a, and they'll sell you one of these for $150. It's a $500 item. Um, it doesn't look like a $500 item, and that's because inside these channels is where the motors are. So there are four motors, and as you can see one here, kind of. Uh, and then they have little bevel gears, which are gears that kind of let you turn rotational motion 90 degrees, and that's how these really cool mechanum wheels are driven. Mechanum wheels are, uh, they're used on forklifts among other things, but one of the things that's really cool about these black beads that are on them is that if I drive this wheel one direction and this wheel the opposite direction, the robot will actually move side to side. So I'm no longer limited to driving forward, backward, and just turning like a car kind of motion. Instead, I can move side to side and do all kinds of really neat motions. These are very, um, effective, especially for autonomous, because you can usually understand where the robot is. Um, I don't know whether this year is going to be great for these, because the barrier is a little bit risky for them. Um, in particular, if you look at this, imagine there's a shaft that goes through that bear, that bead, there are bearings on each end, there are little um, uh, eclipse on each end of it. This is, a, this is a fairly complicated piece of hardware. Driving that at speed over the terrain multiple times in a competition match, I worry that these wheels will start to break over time. So uh, other kinds of wheels may be better. Um, you are going to need four-wheel drive. I would be very surprised if a two-wheel drive robot performed well this year because you're going to get up onto that PVC pipe and you're just going to get stuck and your wheels are going to be spinning. So if you're going to go with a two-wheel drive, you probably have to go with a narrow robot so you can go between the regular area and the warehouse and not go over the terrain. All right, drivetrain. Anything else on drivetrain I should talk about? Where can I find rules regarding what I can and can't go purchase from Home Depot and put on my robot? Yeah, that's a good question, Rory. Um, so there are a bunch of rules in Game Manual 1 about what materials are allowed on your robot. Um, I always thought the rules were silly. Like, there, there's a rule against lead. And I'm like, that's a little arbitrary. But uh, four years ago, we were at a competition and we noticed we had a Mechanum drivetrain. And one of the things that's tricky about a Mechanum drivetrain is you, you really need to have the same amount of weight on each of the four wheels. And if you don't, then when you try to go side to side, the robot will actually curve. 
And so our robot was doing this weird curving behavior when we were driving, when we were trying to strafe. And what we figured out was it was a weight balance issue. It was at that point I realized why lead is prohibited because my first thought was, well, we need something really dense and heavy that we can put on the robot to rebalance it. Why don't we go get some, oh, right, lead is for, for, forbidden. So check game manual one and make sure that you're not looking at buying parts that are illegal. Um, the other kind of part that teams will often look at that isn't allowed is a part that has multiple degrees of freedom. Uh, Gobilda has a new pan tilt kind of thing with a worm gear in it. It's really, really cool. I think it's probably not legal for FTC. And I mentioned earlier McMaster Car. They sell an enormous number of parts that are not legal for FTC because basically you're just buying a part that is like a really sophisticated part of your robot. If you look at this robot, a disallowed part would be this claw. So I can't just go to a store and purchase a claw that does this because it's got two degrees of freedom. It's got two things moving like this. So that's not an allowed FTC part. It's allowed to be on the bot. You just have to build it yourself. You can't just go buy it. I have a question. Go, Colin. Are there any weight restrictions this year? I think there are no weight restrictions this year, but I'll tell you what, if you're making a robot and it weighs more than 40 pounds, you need to get that robot on a diet. You need to make some better life choices about your robot. I bet you got some lead on there. Get the lead out. Come on, lighten up. Um, you get really heavy with a robot. It's hard for the kids to move the thing around. So don't go nuts. All right. Actuators and mechanisms. So we talked earlier about intakes and delivery and that kind of stuff. All of that gets involved in, in this idea of actuators and mechanisms. Uh, a lot of you have already seen all this stuff a million times. Sorry, it's only one slide. You got two kinds of motors, three kinds of motors in FTC. Servos and 12 volt DC motors. There's another rev motor that's cool that's basically a 12 volt motor with, a, with an angle in it. There are different sizes of servos you're allowed to use. This is a Gobilda, uh, I think they call them a standard size. Servo, it's not written on there, but anyway, that's kind of a standard size. There's a full size servo that's big. Um, we had a full size servo on this robot right here because this mechanism was lifting a load. And so for a while last year, this particular servo was bigger. What we realized was uh, it was very expensive and it had about the same amount of torque as the Gorilla servo that was smaller. So we switched out uh, just because it was gonna be easier to have spares and use the Gorilla. Um, in Go sorry, in Gobilda servos, they now have the regular servo, which is just kind of normal speed. Um, they have a turbo that's I think twice as fast, and they have a torque that's half as fast but stronger. Then they have another one that's a five rotation. The five rotation servo is a neat new option. So we haven't gotten one yet, but I think it's going to be cool, especially for some uh, linear slide situations. The 12 volt motors are available. This part of the motor, the base, is a standard motor. This comes from Maxbotics. All FTC motors must actually have exactly that motor. That motor has a little pinion gear that comes out of the end of it, and then that gear is connected to the gearbox. That's this part of the motor. Different build systems are gonna have different gearboxes. A good drivetrain is often a 20 to one speed reduction. So basically this motor spins at 6,000 RPM and this gets it down to maybe 300 RPM, which is a good speed for a drivetrain. This particular motor has um, holes on the end for attaching to go build the channel, which is a fantastic way to attach this. Probably the only way really. Other motors have kind of a thing that goes around them like a clamp and that's okay. Um, not recommended, it's not nearly as reliable. And then this particular motor has an eight millimeter hex shaft that comes out that's really great for transferring torque from the motor to whatever you're building. These gears are, so if you see this hex pattern here on this pinion gear, it goes on the end of this motor and lets me uh, do, I never can remember, so I'm a programmer. We talked earlier about different kinds of coaches. I'm a programmer. So I look at a mechanical thing like this and I'm like, okay, so that one's gonna spin around once and it's only gonna spin that around a little bit. So this makes it slow. Yeah, I did it, right? So we still have to think about that stuff even when we've been doing this forever. Um, surgical tubing, this is a drawer slide. You can get this drawer slide from Home Depot or McMaster Car. There's one similar from a company called Misumi. Uh, this one is also available from GoBuilder now. Mm -hmm. Next month, it'll, it'll be available late, late October, I think. Um, drawer slides are a pretty great way to convert rotational motion out of a motor 
into linear motion because I want to reach further, I want to reach up with my robot. Like if I want to store my team specific shipping element, then I might use a drawer slide to lift that up onto the top of the team alliance specific shipping hub. I'm knocking them out of the park today, folks. I'm getting all kinds of thumbs up from Colin back there. Uh, remember the limits. I think it's 12 on servos, anybody? I meant to look it up before I got here. I think it's 12 servos. That's a lot of servos. I've never seen that many on a robot. Uh, 12 volt motors, eight. But you can only connect four motors to a control hub and then four more motors to an expansion hub. So if you've got two expansion hubs and a cell phone, you can do eight 12 volt motors. And if you have a control hub and an expansion hub, you can do eight 12 volt, motor, 12 volt motors. But if you only have a control hub, then you actually can't really use this because your four motor, your, your four motor channels are gonna be on your drivetrain, and then how are you gonna do anything else? So you pretty much have to have an expansion hub if you're gonna go four wheel drive. Was there a question? No, comments, peanut gallery, okay. Um, gears, chain and belt. Chain and belt are very good. Uh, if you wanna move rotational motion from one spot on your robot to another, chain is easy to adjust and set your length correct. Um, your hands are gonna get greasy and it's a little bit of a hassle, but it's really cool. One hint on chain and belt, you wanna make sure everything's lined up really well. So if you're working with chain and you've got two sprockets and they're like this, it's gonna jump off. Same with belt. You've got to make sure everything's lined up really, really well, or you are setting yourself up for pain and woe. Ask me how I know. Surgical tubing is a great way to create some tension. So if I have a mechanism, like if I'm using this linear slide to reach out or something like that, and I'm worried that as I reach out, I've got a bunch of weight that's out there and I'm going to tip my robot over, or I'm going to not be able to lift it back up, I can put surgical tubing on it back to a point on my robot and then as that goes down or reaches out, it'll build up tension and essentially spring back to where I want it to go. You can do similar stuff with springs. So highly recommend looking into those. And the type of spring that's really handy for um, rotational motion is a torsion spring. If you go by a mouse trap, you'll see one. Sensors, it's all fun and games till we know what's going on. If you wanna do anything in autonomous, you probably are gonna use sensors. There are a lot of them. These are all the ones you can get, or a bunch of them you can get from Rev Robotics. Um, I'm gonna try to name them, but I'm probably wrong. The top right guys are color sensors. These are great. You can point these down on the field and spot the colored tape that's on the field so your robot knows where it is. If it's gray, you're not done the tape yet. If it's white, you got there. Uh, these are touch sensors. These are great for, I picked up a game element. I, yeah, I pushed a little plate that goes against the, uh, the touch sensor. Or I could put it on a wheel. Oh, I can tell that I'm against the wall. Just like if it's dark and you're walking through a hallway and you feel the wall as you're going, you can do the same thing with a touch sensor. This is a, a, a rotational sensor. You can mount that on an arm. So if I have an arm that's doing this kind of motion, I could mount one of these on the axle and then I could tell the angle that the arm is at. Great sensor for that. Um, this, I believe, is the Rev um, laser distance sensor. Sends out a little laser beam, senses when it comes back, and it'll tell, your, tell you your distance to something. It's a good sensor. They say it's a three meter sensor, and that's a little bit of marketing. It doesn't really work at three meters. Um, I think this may be a magnetic sensor where you can have, um, like for the linear actuator that I showed earlier, if I have a linear slide and I want to know, is it all the way in? Is it halfway? Is it all the way out? Where, what's the position on it? I can use these sensors and place these little, uh, these guys on the arm and then place sensors that know, oh, the magnet is now next to the sensor. And so I can tell the position of that. So sensors, key. USB webcam. Uh, the control and communications kit comes with one. That's a strong hint. You probably want to use that. Um, you can use a variety of ways to sense visually what's going on with your robot. You can use a, a library called OpenCV. That's a good way, if you're using the webcam, to understand which of the three spots on the barcode your duck or team-specific shipping element is. Did I get it right that time, Colin? Yeah, you did. Okay, thank you. Um, I need more confidence. Thanks, Colin. So, well, you're doing great. OpenCV is great for that. 
On the side of the fields, there are a bunch of weird pictures. I don't have them with me, but there's a bunch of weird pictures. What the heck are those pictures for? Those are for a system called Vuforia. Vuforia has been set up for this year's challenge, so the programming library knows those images, and those images are kind of special images, like a QR code kind of. And so as your robot is doing its autonomous work, your webcam can use Vuforia and look at one of those targets on the side of the field, and it'll actually know kind of exactly where it is. Your robot will know how it is oriented in three dimensions, and it will know its distance from that Vuforia target. It doesn't work great, but it works pretty well, so Vuforia. Another approach is TensorFlow. TensorFlow is essentially a machine learning library from Google, if I remember right. Uh, and with TensorFlow, you can identify objects on the field. So your webcam could, could tell, oh, that's a block, oh, that's a ball. Um, it could probably spot your team-specific shipping element really well, especially if you make it unique in some way. Um, and a lot of teams, have, a lot of really advanced teams have used TensorFlow to identify, like the Alliance-specific shipping hub. You know, TensorFlow could tell you where the shipping hub is. My suggestion would be that Vuforia would be an easier way to do that, because if your robot knows where it is, the shipping hub shouldn't have moved, so you can kind of count on it being in the right spot. Um, color sensors, I mentioned those earlier as a way to navigate the field, but another way you could use a color sensor is you could mount two on the front of the robot, you could drive up to the barcode area, look at the two spots there might be a duck. If there's a duck on your left color sensor, cool. If there's a duck on your right color sensor, cool. If neither of them have one, it's at the third spot because it's too far away to see with two color sensors on a bot. So it's a good way to use color sensors to get an easy autonomous early in the season. Encoders are a type of sensor that's inside the motor. I mentioned earlier that this motor turns 6,000 RPM. So this, this is a really, you know, they're really fast motors. And it has a port on the bottom. In addition to the power port that you see here, it's got another port with four pins, and those are the encoder output. Each time this little motor turns, it adds to the ticks on the encoder. And so if we imagine using a motor like that on a drivetrain like this, and we wire the encoders from each of these into the control hub, then the control hub can know how many times each of the motors for each of the wheels has turned. And that's a great way for the robot to know, I've probably gone this far. You'll need to know how many ticks there are per rotation. You'll need to know the diameter of your wheels and a bunch of stuff like that. The other thing that's tricky about encoders is, if I take off and I go really fast, I'm going to burn out a little bit, right? I'm going to lose traction. And so my wheels may turn, but my robot might not move. So then the encoders can't really tell you where you are on the field anymore. So you may need to slowly accelerate, slowly decelerate in order to have a predictable position on the field if you're only using encoders and you don't want to use any of the distance sensors. If you're using old encoders or encoders from a third party, you may need these, which are called level shifters. So if you have a 5 volt sensor, the rev system is entirely 3.3 volt, and so you may need one of those in there. Um, and so you can use other sensors from Rev. And then there are also a ton of sensors on robotshop.com. Um, most of them are going to be legal. You may want to ask in the FTC forums about a specific sensor, especially if you feel like, oh, if I had this sensor, everything would become trivial and the whole game becomes super easy. That's a good hint that probably that's not going to be allowed. Um, one example that I've always wanted to use from Robot Shop is a LiDAR, which is a laser-based radar system. Not allowed. Sorry, can't do it. Okay, that was a lot. Did I miss anything on sensors? Colin's still awake, so it's good. All right, let's talk about programming. I'm assuming if you're watching this that you're probably not a fourth year team or student with super sophisticated programming experience with Android Studio and OpenCV. So I'm assuming that you're probably a little bit starting out, which is great. Welcome. Um, I recommend starting out with blocks first. Blocks is a great way to get autonomous working, figure out what's going on, learn the names of the motors, figure out how to configure your robot, figure out how to get some early wins, get that first meet autonomous working really well, score those 20 points, that kind of thing. Blocks, super great for that. Once the blocks are starting to hold you back, if you want to switch to a more sophisticated programming environment, that's probably going to be Java. 
a pretty easy way to do that is actually what happens with blocks is you kind of assemble your program and then when you say save, it actually saves it as a Java file, compiles it in Java, and pushes it up to your control hub. So what you can do is once you've got a fairly sophisticated blocks program that you want to kind of go to the next level and start using in Java, you can literally just export your blocks to Java, pull that into the onbot Java environment, and you've lost no ground. You're, you're exactly where you are. Now, you're probably going to break it almost immediately, because that's the nature of Java. But um, at least you're there. At least you haven't lost any ground. So really good early transition there. Um, I had a team that did an onbot Java a whole year, and they were very successful. If you are starting to get frustrated by that, especially if you have uh, advanced programmers that are experienced in other areas, they may really want to use Android Studio. So that's another viable option. It's a little harder to get everything connected. It's a little more of a hassle. There's some nice things about it, though. You can push your code into GitHub and save a copy everywhere. Um, pretty, it's, it's a pretty nice environment for that. Quick story about programming. Three years ago, maybe two, uh, our programmer um, deleted all his code. So that was frustrating because, you know, we had a competition that week and he deleted all his code. And there was a lot. So it turned out that what saved us was our engineering documentation. I'm going to grab the notebook. And I'll talk more about the engineering documentation later. But our, our team is our team hates trees. So we've, we've killed a lot of trees. I'm sorry for the earth. Uh, but he literally had, like, his code was in the notebook. And so he went back and he basically copy pasted his code out of the notebook back into the robot. So um, yeah, documentation sometimes saves the day. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but I really can't overemphasize this enough. Um, autonomous is key for locking down points. You, you score those early points and you know you begin to, the driver control period with 40 points, you're, you're, you're going to win half your games that way. It's just, it's, it gives you such a leg up. Um, one area, uh, especially for coaches, but also for programmers to, to be aware of is programming is very stressful. It's very stressful because everything works on the robot. The drivetrain works, the intake works, the thrower works, the arm works, all the servos are perfect. There are no mechanical problems with the robot at all. That's what the builders are going to say. And then they're going to hand it to the programmer and say, yeah, dance, monkey, do the programming. <laughs> so <laughs> this is where all the mechanical problems become real, right? They were all hypothetical until we started to do the programming. And so in, this is the moment where you're going to have a little bit of team drama. You're going to have a little bit of the programmer saying the, mecha the, mechanism, the mechanism doesn't work, the wiring is wrong, the sensor has failed. Um, sensors don't fail. So that's, that doesn't happen. I don't, I, every week I've had a, pro a programmer tell me that the sensor has failed. This, this is not even a thing. That doesn't happen. <laughs> Uh, but the programmer will always blame the sensor. Um, so just give them another sensor and say, here, try this one. And then they'll say, ha, ah, that's funny. Um, also, this is, this, is the tip of, this is the programmer I'm talking about, uh, who deleted its code. Here he is you know, retyping it from the engineering notebook. Um, so Drew here uh, did a great job. But this is what they look like, right? They're laying on the field. They're frustrated. It's the night before the competition. Just five more minutes and I'll get those, those additional points in Auton. This is like, it, and it's, there's not a lot of, there's no crying on the field, but you know, keep tissues near. Um, then there's going to be the back and forth from the mechanical team saying, no, the mechanism works fine. We used it with the servo tester and it worked. And then the programmer is going to say, well, but it doesn't work with the rest of the robot or with the code or with the sensors or whatever. So just be ready for that tension. And, it, it's odd because it's, everything's going to go well for the team until the programming starts, and then often it, it gets a little ugly. If you're proud of your programming, you're using interesting sensors in interesting ways, you feel like you've got a great idea that you kind of want to keep secret and not tell other teams about, that's a sign that you should apply for the control award. You've done some great work. Be proud of it. Apply for control. Programming. Anything else about programming? Any questions I should have had? Okay, once we got it built, we got a program, now we got to drive the crazy thing. Your drive team is going to consist of three people. Here they are in blue. 
Uh, you're going to have your bot driver. Who's the bot driver? I think Yassine was the bot driver. So this one person's role is pretty much, let's drive the crazy thing around, right? Let's get it moving on the field. Then the other person's role is going to be to run the intake and run the delivery. So in this year's robot, you're essentially going to have a kid whose job is going to be, I got the grabber, I'm using the grabber, I grabbed the thing, let's go, let's drop it off, right? So you've got two kids. They are going to absolutely get tunnel vision. They are going to have no idea how many seconds are left in the match. They're going to have no idea what the other teams on the field are doing because they are completely concentrating on what that robot is doing and they're trying to do their very best. So you have a third person, a coach. Now, when we say coach in FTC, usually we mean somebody with a lot of gray hair. In this context, let me strongly recommend that you use a student for this. If you don't have enough kids at the field and you don't have enough kids at the competition, sometimes you have to use an adult for this, but really, really strongly recommend that you try to get to the point where you have a kid doing that. The job of the coach on the team is to know how much time is left, to be able to look at the strategy, to be able to say, oh, our warehouse is empty. Let's go to the other warehouse. We can get elements there. To say, oh, the Alliance neutral shipping hub isn't balanced in our way. Go put some heavies on it. No, don't pick up a ball. Pick up a heavy for that. Balls are, you know, balls are what we're putting on the top of our Alliance specific hub. So this is the person who has kind of the big picture for what's going on on the whole on the whole thing. This person is probably also talking to the coach on your alliance partner and making sure that they know the plan, they're sticking to the plan. Um, if there's any correction that needs to happen part way, maybe they're going to hop over there and say, "Hey, do this." Um, yeah, I ranted without looking at my bullet points. Hey, I did pretty well. Okay, driver practice. I mentioned this earlier. You get your robot built, you hand it over to your programmer. Your programmer gets their stuff done. They stop crying finally, their tear ducts are completely empty. Uh, and now it's time to do driver practice. If you can leave your team a week to do driver practice before every competition, it's gonna help you more than anything else you can do. Even if you have a really simple bot with just a push thing and like nothing else, driver practice is probably the best thing you can spend your time on the week before a competition. Um, at that point, just limit yourself to fixes. Don't make improvements to the robot after you know, at, at less than a week before competition. Now, one of your biggest problems with regard to this is your coach. Because your coach is going to look at the robot and say, oh, oh, I'm just going to add this one zip tie. It'll make it better. Oh, I'm just going to peel this sticker off in this one spot. It'll make it better. Oh, I'm just going to tighten this screw. It'll make it better. And the coach needs to sit down and stay out of it because the coach in all of those cases was wrong and made huge mistakes with robots right before competitions. So um, the rules are for everybody, not just the kids. Uh, minimize change as you get close to competitions. Otherwise, you're gonna just be filled with woe. Nobody's gonna know how to drive it. You're gonna have some new part on there. No one's gonna know how to work it. It isn't gonna help you anyway because your drivers won't have practice with it. So don't, don't make a bunch of change right before a competition. If you're near other teams, a great technique is to get together with them for a scrimmage. It helps immensely to play the game with four other, with three other robots on, this, on the field. If you're playing just you, you're in control of where you are, what happens, what the pacing is, where the ducks go, wh whether you're scoring on the uh, neutral shipping hub or the alliance shipping hub. All of those things, the, the world is your oyster when you're by yourself. You put an alliance partner on there, now you're going to realize that your autonomous doesn't work with any other robot ever, so you need to adjust that. You realize that, oh, there are competitors who are going to maybe come and take uh, my freight from me. Um, you, all of the other lessons that you run into. Uh, one that I'm concerned about this year is if you've decided to build a really narrow robot and you're going warehouse, shipping hub, warehouse, shipping hub, there's another robot on your team potentially that wants to take that same route. So now you've got to negotiate, hey, you stick to the Alliance neutral shipping hub and I'll stick to this one and then we won't be in each other's way. Um, also, there's some opportunities for defense this year. Uh, it's there's the potential that a robot with a lot of traction and a lot of pushing power, especially if you look at a robot like this one with mechanical wheels, this doesn't have a whole lot of traction. So if somebody, somebody came along with a tank tread, they could probably just push the robot to the side. And that's a legal move for a robot to make. So that, that may come up uh, a lot this year. Getting together with other teams for scrimmages is the best way to figure that out before you get to a competition. First slide we did, gracious professionalism. If your match is going badly and you're yelling at your teammate, if this guy is yelling at this guy about how he's messing up, 
Right over here, out of the shot, is a judge. And that judge is watching that behavior. And that judge is going to notice, wow, that got really ugly really fast. And they're going to write a note about how Team 6547 did not handle you know, when, the, when the wheel fell off their robot. And that's going to go back to the rest of the judges during deliberation so they can take that into account. The flip side of that is, if you're standing there, I don't have this robot with me today, but if, if your team has their robot fall and break the first thing that happens in autonomous, and your team stands there and dances and has fun and quite literally plays Tetris on the drive phone because they installed Tetris as an op mode. Why would they install Tetris as an op mode on the drive? Anyway, <laughs> if they stand there and play Tetris and just have fun despite the fact that the robot failed utterly, the judge who's right over here notices that, writes it up. Hey, 6547 had this terrible thing happen. And they just, they just ran, ran with it, had fun, danced after the match, and came back for the next one. That's the character you'd want to show as a team. So if something goes horribly wrong, don't lose your cool. And that's a great thing to practice that week before competitions. If you're working on your team and it's very stressful and you're frustrated about your autonomous and somebody ran the wrong op mode and nothing's going right, how you deal with that in practice, probably how you're going to deal with that when you get to the, to the competition field. So focus on that. Um, that's a great way to stay in line with gracious professionalism. Go. Two thoughts. Colin has two thoughts. I'm going to jump up here real quick. Oh, he's coming, he's coming. I'm just, I'll be over here. Okay, real quick. Two things. So, there's judges watching. There's also the refs watching. So, uh, there could be a lot of penalties that go into, and warnings, that go into that bad situation happening. So just remember, there's a, there are a lot of people that are around the field that are all watching. And it could be on camera. Just really keep that in mind. So there could be... Live like, streaming to everyone's yeah, grandma. A lot of people. Other thing is... Uh, who is the person next to 6547 on the, on the top picture? Yes. That game was a human player. There is not a human player designation this year. Um, well, I didn't list it because it's not a thing. Um, when you move the carousel, a, a person has to do that. It has to be one of the team members. So your bot driver or your arm driver, one of the four people doing that on either team is the one doing that. It is not a human player. It could be the coach as well. It can be one of the six, right? I don't know. I don't think the coach can. Oh, all right. That's that's a good thing to the check. Forums. Yes, um, but that's gonna. There is not a human player person this year, uh, so be really careful of that because if you guys want to do the carousel, you might have to have somebody come off of your controller to do that. So just keep that in mind. That's what I think. That's a really good point, and, and a subtlety to that is it means that your end game plan, you probably need it to work with one controller and not depend on two people driving. Um, yeah, great point, Colin. Um, the other thing is that you may need to negotiate with your alliance partner. Okay, who's going to place the ducks? And you want to make sure that whoever's placing the ducks is doing that effectively um, and knows the rules, and the duck has to be touching the bar that makes them fall off and all that good stuff. And you can't place until they're stopped. Okay. All right, so that was a lot of goals, team organization, build a robot, program a robot, drive a robot. I think that's everything on the robot stuff. So let's talk about outreach. There are uh, as many ways to do outreach as there are teams. My, high re my strong recommendation is figure out outreach that's unique to you, your community, your opportunities, your uh, parents and mentors that are involved with your team, figure out what's good there. I've always told people your best outreach opportunity is basically, is basically this, right? So this right here is, is just, this is from a few years ago, you can tell because no one's got a mask on, right? Um, this is our team running a STEM camp for elementary school kids. One of them was completely crazy until his dad got there, it was a hassle. Move on. Um, so had these kids out for like three hours and did a bunch of STEM activities with them. Made some slime, did some, uh, you know, building the, building the structures out of spaghetti and marshmallows. You guys have done all this stuff. You know what I'm talking about. These guys hadn't done it before, right? And they got these cool science coats they could take home and they learned a bunch of STEM stuff. They learned about FIRST and we gave flyers to each of the parents about how to start an FLL team. And if anybody had started an FLL team, we would have provided mentoring for that. So then we're connecting all of the things, right? We've got our excited FTC kids 
working with younger kids from the community to do STEM outreach and teach them STEM skills and promote first. That's a really great overall outreach opportunity. So if you, don't, if you need an idea, that's kind of the best thing. Anything else you do that kind of ticks those boxes is gonna be good in similar ways. So what are some other ways you can do that? Identify nonprofits that you can work with. Um, here in Kansas City, Ronald McDonald House runs a um, trunk or treat thing every October. And our team usually goes and we take a demo robot and we throw candy to kids. That's fun, it's cool. Um, a better one we've done also with Ronald McDonald House is we took our robot in the evening and at Ronald McDonald House, uh, it's basically like a hotel that families can stay at while their kids are getting some sort of hospital treatment. And often the kids have siblings who are bored out of their mind. And so we take their robot and we let those kids drive their robot. They have the best time ever. And we've got kids coming in, they're doing cancer treatment or whatever, they got no hair, they're in a wheelchair, and they're driving a robot, they're having the best time ever, right? These are great, great, highly recommended. Um, involve your parents and mentors. So especially a lot, of, a lot of parents say to me, Mr. Crocker, I'm not an engineer. I don't feel like I can come to a meeting and really help and move things forward for the team. Outreach is a great opportunity for those folks to get involved. They can organize something. They can find a nonprofit. Maybe they already have a relationship with a nonprofit uh, that they're excited about and they've got the right contacts and they can facilitate that kind of adult to adult interaction that has to happen for some kinds of events and then bring the team to the event and, and off you go. It's, it's a really great overall system, um, especially if you're a classroom teacher and you're a little bit like, yes, I know that they have parents, but if I could never interact with them, that would be great. Um, this might be a good opportunity to kind of put that in a, in a contained area and say, yeah, let's have you do this. Um, Building Halloween costumes, fun. We've built some Halloween costumes for kids in wheelchairs. I bet there's one on the screen here. Uh, why do I not see it? Anyway, it's not on here, it's somewhere else. Um, so these are a few, this is the uh, bottom left is a STEM camp we ran for little kids. Uh, bottom left second is uh, we built electric cars along with another FTC team, uh, Red Hot Techie Peppers. Uh, this is our kids presenting to the superintendent of Blue Valley Schools about how they should fund robotics teams in Blue Valley Schools. They managed to get $100,000 a year allocated for that, basically by showing up and being kids and just saying, give us money for this. Um, it worked shockingly well. Uh, and this is the kids, uh, we did an outreach event with uh, Vibrant Health. It was basically like, get, get a shot, get your uh, vaccinations for flu and that kind of thing for little kids. Get your shot, drive our bot, was kind of the idea there. Uh, another one, help at FLL events, right? Uh, we're always looking for volunteers at all of the levels of FIRST programs, and so if you're interested in just helping queuing and stuff like that, it's great for little kids who are doing FLL to see bigger kids who are doing FTC. <laughs> They're like, yeah, later I can do that, right? And it's great role modeling. So all of these great outreach opportunities. But don't limit yourself to this. Come up with your own ideas, talk to the other parents and mentors who are involved, do something your kids are excited about. Those are the things that are gonna really resonate with your team and with judges and make everything better. All right, then we have to document it. So it's all fun and games, doing stuff, until you actually write it up and um, the rules have changed a little bit. If you're new, that doesn't impact you, so yay. Um, most judged awards require the engineering portfolio and documentation showing what you did. The idea and the way judging flows is your team goes into judging, you have about a five minute presentation, you run through your presentation, the judges who are volunteers, it's their first time doing this, go easy on them. They've got your engineering portfolio, it's 15, 16 pages. They flip through it, they kind of get a feel for what you're doing, they listen to your presentation, they ask questions, they write notes. Then your room of judges has to meet with judges from other rooms. And so the judges from your room saw your team, but the judges from the other rooms didn't. And essentially the judges from your room need to be able to show the other judges why you're better than the other judges' favorite team for some award. And the portfolio is the tool you're giving them to show the other judges what you did. And if you don't have what you've accomplished and what you've struggled with, um, they can't do it, right? They can go in and tell the other judges, but it, it's a little it's a little squishy. If one, if one set of judges has pictures of stages of development of an intake, and the other judges are like, yeah, they said they built like a whole bunch of different ones, the team that has the better documentation has a much more clear shot at an award. 
we use on our team daily logs. And the daily logs are uh, entered using a Google form. And this is literally a screenshot of the form over on the right. A kid on my team put it together, and uh, the kids on the team nag each other to fill it out after every meeting. So this all goes into a Google spreadsheet. And the idea, once we're further on in the season, is we'll go take all of those daily logs and we'll distill them down. And we'll use those to build the engineering notebook. So this is, again, my team hates trees. Um, this is an engineering notebook from a couple of years ago. This was a very high quality engineering notebook. Really, I mean, the kids did an incredible job on this. I've never, like, I've never seen this page before, right? This wasn't done by mentors. Um, the, the, uh, this is hundreds and hundreds of pages uh, that they did in Adobe InDesign based on information from the daily logs plus photos. Um, and I didn't mention this earlier, but a great thing for mentors to do at meetings is take photos, right? Because you need photos of kids, you don't need photos of adults. So if you've got a board mentor at a meeting, have them, have them take pictures. So the daily log has essentially, here's what we did each day. This is September 3rd of 2019. We met from 7 to 8.30 at a storage mart because that's where we met then. We were in an RV storage slot. Um, and we were working on a Halloween costume. It was for Macy and we were working on cutting the foam and we started doing some painting. So that's what we did on September, 9th, September 3rd of 2019. Daily logs. Now where does the engineering notebook live? Let me, I'm gonna grab the portfolio just so you can kind of see the difference. Here's the portfolio. The portfolio is 16 pages. 15 because the first page needs to just be a cover sheet. Um, cover sheet shows your team number. If you don't have your team number on your engineering portfolio, just stay home. Please put your team number on your engineering portfolio. You have to have your team number on your engineering portfolio. And here's why. If you don't, and you hand it in at the beginning of the uh, league championship, it's gonna go to the judges and they're gonna look at it and they're gonna say, huh, I wonder what team this is. And they're gonna have absolutely no idea. So then they're gonna take your engineering portfolio and they're gonna go around the competition and look at each team and say, I don't know, that might be them. Hey, is this your portfolio? I don't know if they'll even be allowed to do that. In some situations, they just look at it and they say, no team number, we can't consider it. So don't put yourself in that situation. Um, it, ha it happens like about 15% of the time, I think is what I've been told. So team number on engineering portfolio. Again, it's about 15 pages. This is super dense. This is the season timeline. This one shows community outreach. And I wanna reiterate, I've never seen these pages before. Kids did all of this. This is very high quality layout. Um, everything is really, really great. Uh, but if you don't have a kid on your team who can do this sort of thing and you do have a mentor, this can be a pretty appropriate mentor sort of thing for them to, to fill in early on in the season. So very, uh, this is outreach, walking and rolling, STEM experiments for healthcare clinics. I talked about that earlier. COVID-19 awareness. We did a bunch of face shield manufacturing and stuff like that. Uh, a nonprofit that we work with and connections to the first community. And so what we're trying to show here kind of with each page is justification for why we are a reasonable choice for the different awards that, that, we, that we think we might be considered for. Um, another engineering portfolio that you can see online, these, uh, I'll laser these. So ours, 6547 is here. And then our friends, uh, the Astromex um, is here. Um, 3409 is their team number. This is their engineering portfolio. Um, I never really looked at it. I just printed it out today because Ken sent me a link. Yeah, it's been great stuff. Talks about how they did their stuff, the evolution of their mechanism, how they made their shooter ramp, how they calculated their bomb, what kinds of um, community outreach they did, collaboration, um, 3D printed PPE like we did, um, and sustainability, how they're gonna fundraise and recruit. So, super engineering portfolio. Not so thick, you don't have to kill a lot of trees for that, but you have gotta have one or you're not gonna get any judged awards at all. Um, engineering notebook I talked about earlier. Okay, so I showed you the one where we killed the tree, right? The thick one? Yeah. Here's the other one, that was part two. Uh, this is part one. You don't have to have the crazy engineering notebook. This was from a few years ago when this was the only thing we submitted. 
I don't know how seriously judges are going to take the engineering notebook this year. They will not receive it when you check in for events. They will not get it. They will only get your engineering portfolio. You're going to turn in your portfolio. That's it. If the judges have questions, if they look at it and they say, hey, did you really build that? They, they may come to the pit after um, judging and have a series of questions for you. At that point, they may want to look at the engineering notebook and see, okay, do you have actual CAD of that? Can you show me when, you know, how that went with that outreach event on that particular day? That sort of thing. So I'm not really sure what the best practice will be for organizing your engineering notebook, the big tome that really just sits in your pit. Um, and maybe a judge will come look at it and maybe not. It's, it's really hard. Social media. Judges, if you are making claims about outreach events and things like that, judges will definitely look at your social media. They will look to confirm, oh, yeah, let's scroll back. Did they really post about this event? Did they do this outreach or did they just like Photoshop it, whatever. So you need to have some social media, post your stuff there. Judges will really look at it. I'm gonna look back to something on the portfolio and the engineering notebook. And I, I bet Astromix did a great job of this. You don't wanna have any kid last names, no youth last names in this whole thing. I don't think they even, oh they do. So no, they've got mentor names. I don't know if they've even got uh, team member names, even first names. But you definitely do not want to have anything that is personally identifiable information. Uh, we've seen teams in the past that turn in their roster as part of their um, portfolio. That is the opposite of what you should do because your roster has like phone numbers and emails and last names in it. Do not do that. So this should only have first name, last initial of students. Social media, engineering portfolio, these are some example pages from it. Again, download these and print them out. They, these, are, these are both truly excellent engineering portfolios. Do not feel like you need to like, match up with all of that. These are two crazy teams. So if you're a new team, like this is maybe something to shoot for three years down the road. Don't, don't kill yourselves. Presentation. So now we've built the robot, we've programmed it, we've competed, we wrote our documentation, now we're gonna do a presentation. Your presentation this year will probably be done live and in person. So your team will kind of line up and they'll do a five minute prepared presentation about what you wanna share. It's kind of the story of your team and your season for the year. You wanna sum up what you've accomplished, what you're proud of, uh, maybe some of what you struggled with as well. Judges are always interested in that. And that presentation is five minutes. At the end of your five minutes, you may find that if you're finishing a thought, they'll, give, they'll let you do it, kind of like the end of a soccer game, right? They'll let the play end. But some judges may be like, five minutes, that's it. And that's okay too, that's, if that's how the judges wanna run their room. Um, <laughs> last year, we were, we, so we did, of course, like everything else, uh, Zoom presentation. So this is the kids doing the Zoom presentation. Um, <laughs> and they had practiced a ton, and they were like five minutes and ten seconds. And I was like, adrenaline's gonna solve it, they'll still be five minutes, it'll be great. So they go into presentation, and they told me after, they said, Mr. Crocker, the judge had like a timer, and 30 seconds before five minutes, this timer went up. So at four and a half minutes, they're just like, they've got their thing, they've run this presentation a thousand times, you know exactly what they're saying, like, doo -doo 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 -doo. this alarm goes off, and kind of throws them off, and the judge says, 30 seconds remaining, and then they're like, okay, and then they just pick back up and do it, and they end exactly at five minutes. And they said the judge was like, well, that seemed to be very precise, which it was. Um, practice, practice, practice. So I would recommend practicing via Zoom. It is possible something will happen, and you might have to do judging on Zoom. It's also pretty convenient for the kids. They're all used to Zoom, everybody does it all the time, so Go ahead and practice live, but I would also practice via Zoom. It's not gonna hurt anything. Um, and I, we've had, especially depending on the time of year, kids can't come, come to a meeting in the evening, but they can hop on a Zoom and practice presentation. So that can work well. At the end of presentation, the judges, who are first time volunteers, they did training, but they literally like, they just started, it's their first day. So go easy on them, right? Um, they're gonna ask a series of questions. Uh, this is a great role for your parents and mentors to occupy when you're practicing your presentation, which is basically to ask those questions. The best questions you can ask as a parent or mentor or coach is essentially something you think is going to stump the team, something really hard, like uh, where did you get the idea for that, where you know like 
there was an idea they saw on YouTube, or uh, how, how did this go wrong? Uh, here are some example questions. How'd you come up with your ideas? That's a great one. If the kids came up with their ideas, they're gonna be super proud of it, and they're gonna talk about it kind of at length. If the kids didn't come up with their ideas and their coach did, you're gonna hear that. What went wrong when building? Was everything kind of established and, and super easy and we didn't really have any struggles? No, we struggled and kids are gonna to wanna to talk about that. This is a great question to ask. What's your game strategy? So how are you approaching autonomous, teleop, end game? Tell us about an interesting person you met this year. Basically, did you meet anyone that wasn't on your team this year? This is a great question and as a judge, you're gonna learn a lot about teams by asking this one. And then this comes up almost every presentation. What does gracious professionalism mean to you? In some cases, they may pick a specific kid and say, Carol, what does gracious professionalism mean to you? So each kid on your team probably needs to have a really good answer to this. Maybe a story about how gracious professionalism came into their life. Uh, they were positively impacted by somebody else. They felt like they were exhibiting gracious professionalism, those kinds of scenarios. It comes up all the time. All right, and again, this is another good way. If you're a classroom teacher, this is a great way to say, parents, come in and watch the presentation and then pepper them with questions because random questions from random parents is precisely what you're gonna get from first time volunteer judges who did training, but it's their first day, right? Okay, any other thoughts about presentation? Okay, mentors. I wanna talk now about two kinds of mentors. This is the first one. I've talked about mentors a bunch and parents and that kind of stuff, but it's really critical to involve them. Uh, it's an area that I struggle with. It's, it's hard for me to ask for help. It's hard for me to involve other parents where I don't know what their capabilities are. I don't know what their interests are, their time availability, all those things. It's just hard. So um, ask parents to help with the team. This is super hard for classroom teachers. I see most school-based teams kind of struggle with this. So uh, I tell my kids this. If you have a weak area, that's where you need to work. Right? If you have an area that makes you uncomfortable, that's probably what you need to be working on. Um, try to work with engineers for ideas. If you can get some mechanical engineers in, if you're a software person like me, maybe you need to get some mechanical engineers in to help design mechanisms or give feedback to kids as they're working on things to say, oh, a four bar could solve this, or those sorts of things. Um, and professional engineers are gonna know best practices and be able to tell kids, oh, that kind of mechanism is called this. Go watch these YouTube videos about it and now you'll know this knowledge about how to do that. If you've got writers, like a professor from the University of Miami, <laughs> then get them involved with the notebook and the portfolio. She's sitting here with Braden, or, and he's got his dead tree there in front of him. Um, uh, parents, as I mentioned earlier, are great on coordinating outreach. That's a good like one day opportunity for a parent who doesn't want to commit to be there every Tuesday forever, but can do a Saturday. Um, have them act as practice judges for presentation and QA, uh, provide snacks and lunch, those kinds of things, and then key, 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 have them volunteer for events. Parents volunteering for events get training from first about how to do their role. If they're score tracking, they now know the game really well. If they're a ref, they know the game super well. If they're a judge, they know all of the behind the scenes stuff about how judging works. If they're judging or doing those other roles, often they won't be able to do those while your team is on the field and so or, or uh, involved in judging. And so it may be that the parents need to volunteer at a different event. So not your league championship, but a different one. Uh, but it provides an enormous asset to the team because then when you do your practice presentation, if you have five parents who've judged before, they know all the questions that are in the judge training. They know all the questions that have come up before when they've been in with teams. Who better than them to help the team practice so that their presentation is as good as it can be? Another kind of mentor is just outside adult, random people from the community. There's a new FIRST mentor network. Register your team there and ask for the kind of mentor support you need. I ask for mechanical engineers, because that's our blind spot. Talk with local businesses, get them excited about FIRST. It is really crazy how excited local businesses can get, especially if you've got um, kids that are reaching out to potential mentors. People want to help kids become their best selves, right? That's, that's totally a normal human behavior. So if you give them an opportunity to participate with your team that way, they're going to get engaged with that. I mentioned earlier this idea of a, we had a kid who reached out to a manufacturer and said, hey, can you help us make this part on our robot? And they said, nah. And then an hour later, they were like, yeah, sure. So that's a great kind of setup to do. Um, and having kids do that interaction usually makes it go better. Uh, we had a kid on our team several years ago who wanted to hand out 
fidget spinners at state. He wanted to hand out 1,500 fidget spinners at state. And I said, Lance, he was on the screen earlier. That's Lance right there. Um, I said, Lance, we don't have that kind of budget. And he said, if I go raise $1,500, can we give out fidget spinners at state? And I said, sure, because what's it going to hurt? So Lance goes door to door and he talks to different businesses and says, hey, would you donate $50 to my robotics team? And he raises $1,500. And then we had to make more fidget spinners than you can possibly even imagine. We couldn't even get them done on 3D printers, so we had to laser cut them. Um, so reach out to your local businesses. They want to help you. They want to engage with you. Give them an opportunity to do that. Again, engineers and best practices is really key. This kind of activity is tied in directly to the award that we talked about earlier, the Connect Award. Oh yeah, in addition to gracious professionalism, we should also try to have fun. So try to get your team together. Um, teams that want to hang around with each other socially are going to be better at that programmer situation that I mentioned earlier, where the programmer's mad, the builder's mad, nothing's working. If they've got some social credit with one another and they trust each other, that's going to go better than if they've never really hung around and played a game together. So stuff we've done, Dungeons and Dragons. This does not go well. You've got like a dungeon master who's super rule focused, and you've got a chaotic, neutral team member. Where's your scene? He's not out there. <laughs> anyway, yeah, he, he, so you get some opposites, and you get some tension in the room. Um, so, yeah, it was fun though. Uh, game nights, just bring some board games in, bring in a Switch, and everybody plays Super Smash Bros. and is completely shocked that some tiny girl just destroys all the boys and they're weeping openly. That's the best for everyone. Uh, board game night was super fun. Uh, we've been ice skating, a picture of that, we know. Um, ice skating was great, like falling on your butt and getting wet in the slush, that's, that's just, you're meeting each other and getting to know each other. We played Pokemon Go, we would have like a lunch break, and we'd go play Pokemon Go at like the nearby um, gym and, uh, and do raids and stuff like that. This is good time. Escape rooms, kickball, don't play kick room, kickball in the shop though, we did learn that. Um, Dave and Buster, so this is the kids at Dave and Buster's, this is so funny. So each kid spent like 20 bucks on Dave and Buster's, and you get the dumb tickets, right? And then at the end, if you have a, a thousand tickets, you can get a pencil eraser. But they uh, combined all their tickets, and they got, um, they got the slot. His name is Frederick. Uh, and he actually, the, the uh, windbreaker fits him really well. His arms are a little long, but other than that, good guy. Um, Dave and Buster's, good time. Dancing. I told the kids, I got a bunch of rookies this year, I told the kids, hey, tonight we're gonna have dance practice. And some of them were like filled with disbelief. And some of them were very optimistic and excited. And some of them were dead set against it. Uh, all of which were natural reactions to dance practice. Uh, so then we learned the Cotton Eye Joe. And then a couple weeks later, we had dance practice again and we learned YMCA. And uh, we still gotta work on some other ones. But this is the team dancing at an event. Um, this, this is the, the blue guys. I forget who the purple ones are. Oh man, I can't remember. Yeah, anyway, they were great kids. And the, the pink guys over here were uh, an FLL team that was like FTC rookies that year. They were game, they were so fun. So um, there's a moment right before awards where you're in a stadium in a gym, right? And it's so boring because you're waiting for the judges to decide which team gets which award and all of that stuff and they write up these funny things about each team. And so there's just kind of this 20 minutes where there's not a lot going on. Learn to dance, get up and dance, it's very fun, highly recommended. And then, uh, why did I leave it last? But the team went swimming one time too. All right, fun. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, any questions from the peanut gallery? Oh, I'm in the peanut gallery. Colin is in the peanut gallery. Okay, so here's... Um, I left the camera so it focuses on you because it went really blurry. Ah, hello, I am a blob. Uh, it's fine. So, uh, as we've just established, uh, all of the volunteers, all of the mentors, students are all human. And uh, while Glenn was talking about more of the team stuff, I made sure of that rule, which is something that could happen at an event, especially for the head referee that wants to make sure they get it right, like me. Uh, so I checked that, I uh, double checked the rule. It is any drive team member can oh, okay. move uh, ducks onto the carousel. Okay. However, they're still not a human player. So someone's going to have to leave what they're doing to do that. 
you will have to coordinate with your team on your alliance, the other team on your alliance, to figure out who's doing that if you guys want to do it. If nobody does it and you guys aren't prepared to do it, it may not happen. So just be aware of that when you're getting to that point. Okay. So, Thank you, um, yeah, Absolutely. Also, any of the rules, form, team updates, game manual, FTC website, other teams, other mentors, Casey Stem, First of Missouri, so many resources. So if you have any questions after this video, please go ask. There's so many people that want to give you an answer. And, but remember that, that not all of those answers are equivalent. So if first prints a game manual with updates in it, those are your best, these are the rules. If first has a forum post, that's your second best, these are the rules. If you're having a discussion with a referee or a score tracker about a rule subtlety where you're sure that a rule has been updated on the forums, and maybe they're not aware of that yet, having a printout of that is very productive. So if you've got a part on your robot that isn't quite a normal part, but there is a forum post saying, yes, that's okay, having a printout of that forum post might be a really good idea for robot inspection, just to make sure you can clarify with that robot inspector volunteer that, oh no, they clarified these rules and now this part's allowed. Um, Especially with the referees as well, same thing. Yeah. If you have a ruling that you're, you may need to let someone know about, like, hey, we're gonna be doing this thing, it's, mm. It's close, but it's legal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely bring that up before the match. I've had people ask a very vague question about how to do one thing in a game, and it absolutely broke the game, but they didn't finish listening, and they just did it instead of getting the correct answer, and they ended up getting a bunch of yellow cards and penalties because they weren't paying attention. So just be aware of that when you're actually going to the field. The referees want to know what you're doing if you were doing something that may be close to something, right? Yeah. Especially like defense, right? That's going to be a big one too. Right. Um, yeah, do you want to clarify anything about blocking and pinning? Uh, sure. So um, the big rules that they're going to care about for if you're playing defense are blocking, pinning, and trapping. Basically, if you're not allowing a robot to do a thing, there could be a penalty that could lead to cards. So physic I actually have the cards because I brought something ref related. So like a physical yellow card or a red card. Um, Yellow card's just a warning. Red card is you get disqualified for the match. You don't get any points for that match. Even if you won by a bunch of points, it doesn't matter. Um, those could stack up quickly if you're not careful. So especially for pinning, blocking, and trapping, or egregious behavior on the field or off the field. Um, so you know, judges are watching, refs are watching, volunteers are watching, so be careful, be gracious and professional. That's what we're here to do. We're all trying to have fun, right? So. One thing we didn't really talk about earlier was um, at a meet or the league championship or beyond, how do we rank robots? And in the past, we've ranked robots uh, off of wins. But in this year's game, we rank robots a different way. Do you want to talk about that or is that sure. even on? So, yeah, normal or in other seasons, there have been win-loss records that give you ranking points. Those ranking points will rank the teams and there'll be a bunch of tiebreakers based on them. Autonomous score, end game score, various things like that. This year, it's just a pure game score. So if you score 50 points in one match and 60 points in another match, your ranking score is gonna be 110 after those first two matches. Highest ranking team, or uh, the highest ranking four teams will be considered the Alliance captains if it goes to uh, Alliance selection in playoffs. So for the league championships, state, and worlds. Um, if you get penalties, those will be subtracted from your score. Like we were talking about earlier, minor are 50 or 10 points, majors are 30 points. Those are really difficult to make up this year. So just you know, try to avoid those and be aware of what's happening if you do score one of those. The referees are gonna tell you if you get those. Uh, we're not gonna just give you penalties for the sake of giving you penalties. We would never do that. But we're also gonna tell you why you got it. So, so hopefully you don't do it again. And if it's something we know you guys are either actively trying to do or it's something that's really against, you know, the greatest professionalism and cooperation, it could be a bit of a problem that leads to cards. Yeah, so pay attention. If you're getting penalties in early matches, you need to try to understand why and work to avoid that moving forward. And if you feel like they weren't fair, then you can go to the question box that's outside the field, stand there, and a ref will come over and talk with you about that. And so you can get that clarified so you understand what the rule is and why it's being called that way. You may see that if you're at a meet and there's a particular ref there, they're going to call things one way. And at your league championship, it can be called a little bit different, same as you advance on. 
And so don't be terribly surprised if the types of calls you're seeing are just a little bit different, especially in gray area situations like blocking. Be aware that not only rulings, but the physical field has a little bit of tolerance to it. So just because you have, if you guys have everything perfect at your field at home, great. When you get to competition, it may not be exactly perfect the way you guys had it. We've had a lot of arguments in the past about, well, the field, you know, we, ha we have it this way at home. And it, it, we have it the way that the manual says. We're, we're building it exactly the way you should, but it may not be exactly perfect. So. Yeah, there's a plus or minus one inch um, on everything on the field. So when you're thinking about spinning those ducks, if you've got a really narrow wheel that you're using to turn the turntable and you're at a different competition, your wheel may not touch. So you're gonna to wanna to check that. You'll have an opportunity to do that as part of the robot inspection process. Your robot will be inspected and then you'll drive it on the field. When you drive it on the field, that's your chance to make sure your duck spinner works, make sure your webcam works with the lighting at the venue, that your color sensors are calibrated correctly, all of that good stuff. There's a sensor I forgot to mention earlier that if somebody were here, they probably would have asked about, and that's the gyroscope sensor. The rev control hub and the expansion hub, which are these guys on the side of the robot, uh, actually has a gyroscope inside it, and it appears as a sensor. You can use that to understand how the robot is oriented, and that's a really great way to manage turns in autonomous. Highly recommend you look into the gyroscope. Another thing that I wanted to talk about was resources that you could get for improving your team. There's a Facebook group called FTC Help or something like that. I forget the name. It's okay. It's mostly coaches and parents. There's a Reddit. Uh, the FTC subreddit is usually pretty high quality. Um, a lot of questions and answers that go on there. And then there's an FTC Discord. Discord is much more of an interactive chat kind of thing, uh, but there is history and it's searchable. So if you have a question about the game or something like that, hopping in the Discord and doing a search is often a great way to find answers. And if you're having a problem, there are often just other kids on other teams that are sitting there on Discord. And if you hop in and say, hey, I'm trying to get OpenCV to do blah, 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 there's somebody in there who's done that for four seasons and they're happy to help you with that. So um, definitely reach out to those kinds of things for help. If you're aware of a team that's done something with their robot or outreach or notebook or whatever in the past that you'd like to replicate, drop them an email and say, how'd you do this? How'd you get started with that? Do you have anything you can send me? Most teams are really happy to do that. We had a team email us a few weeks ago about our drivetrain from last year asking how we'd set it up when we sent them a bunch of dimensions and pictures and I think some cat photos and stuff like that. So uh, definitely reach out to people. It's a great way to just interact with the community. This is not a competition between your team and my team. It's a competition between your team and these crazy ducks and balls and cubes and getting them moved around on the field. So the more you embrace the idea that really we're just competing with these game elements and trying to score as many points as we can, the better you're going to do. Because the other teams that are there, if you have a motor burnout, we're going to hand you a replacement. We're happy to help you. So remember, remember that attitude. It kind of all goes back to that early, that first slide we looked at, gracious professionalism. The more you're aligning with that, the better you're going to do and the more fun you're going to have. Anything else? I totally agree. All right. Thanks for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. Good luck this season. Have fun. Good luck. Have fun.